The Royal Christmas Switch by Melinda Curtis Naughty Elf Pronunciation, Naughty Elf Definition, Full of Knots Common use in Christmas Town, an avid, skilled knitter and lover of Christmas, a passion sometimes sidetracked by holiday matchmaking. Christmas Town Herald World News Section Sources claim it's another romance gone awry for Prince Evander of Verdania after reports surfaced of an altercation between the prince, the U.S. ambassador's daughter, and her current business mobile boyfriend. Legions of royal watching fans are on high alert, waiting for a glimpse of the prince, eager for him to confirm or deny his relationship status. Prologue December 1 over the River Retirement Home, Christmas Town, Maine. I'm so excited about this year's Christmas pageant. Odette King tugged at her gold fringed, snowflake sweater as she and her two closest friends walked behind younger members of the Christmas Town Pageant Committee toward the lobby. It keeps getting better and better every year. Not only did Miss Featherpots write a musical about Jack Frost and his winter wonderland, now we're going to experience it live on stage. Who would have thought? And the good news is that this storm of the century will be long gone by the Christmas Eve performance. June Baxter adjusted her olish glasses and studied the committee members ahead of them. It wasn't just any big storm. Oh, no. Mother Nature was bringing a bomb cyclone, a doozy of a snow wallop, followed by a series of significant snowstorms. The bomb cyclone was predicted to drop 10 plus feet of snow in the next 24 hours, followed by up to 3 feet of snow daily for the next several days. That was enough snow to bring the state of Maine to a grinding halt for at least a week. I heard they aren't going to allow us to leave over the river for three days, June continued. Minimum. You know what that means. I do know what that means. Prudence Parker pulled her two friends aside in the holiday-decorated hallway. She pointed toward the lobby with a jingle of tiny bells from one of her bracelets. Those single pageant committee members will be snowed in and alone. Ahead of them, one of the town's youngest and newest sheriffs gave a wide berth to a hanging sprig of mistletoe. The naughty elves scoffed in unison. It's hard for Christmas Town to work its holiday love magic when everyone is snowed in, Odette agreed, still frowning at the single lawman. Ahead of them, several of the committee members left. It's hard for us, the naughty elves, to help the holiday love magic work, June amended. Over the years, she and her friends had become quite good at nudging love along. June's gaze turned sly. I heard Byron Westbug has a snowmobile in the equipment shed. Whoever has the key won't be shut in. More committee members left until only Mercy Montgomery remained, bundled up against the cold like a gingerbread house, seam sealed closed with thick icing, interior safe from the icy chill. I haven't been on a snowmobile in decades and... Hold on. Prue pointed toward two black SUVs that pulled in front of the lobby entrance. Who's that? The trio peered through the lobby windows and the thickly falling snow toward the vehicles. The windows had a dark tint such that they could only see hints of shadows inside. Government agents? Prue guessed, with complete seriousness. Santa and his elves? Odette guessed, with complete hopefulness. No, June drew the word out as she spotted a handsome, sophisticated-looking man pop out of the lead SUV. That, my friends, is our last chance to nudge Christmas Town's holiday love magic along until after these storms pass. The naughty elves linked arms and hurried forward. Chapter 1 Just a few minutes prior, Mercy Montgomery had a long list of impossible tasks to accomplish and less time than needed to get things done before she reopened the Hollyberry Inn. This is why Santa needs a workshop full of elves. Mercy followed her other Christmas Town Pageant Committee volunteers down the hallway of the retirement home. She admired the door decorations as she passed, a wreath with glittery gold ribbon and eight hand-stitched reindeer, a cluster of bells attached to a sprig of pine, a large, blinking snowflake. 
There was Christmas wherever Mercy looked it over the river, along with finished walls, clean carpets, and modern lighting. In comparison, the Victorian and Mercy called home was unfinished, filled with construction supplies, full of renovation challenges, and without a lick of holiday cheer. Including inside Mercy. That's what stress did to a person. It sapped all their holiday exuberance. Look at the snow coming down, someone ahead of Mercy said as the group entered the retirement home's lobby. Over a foot of snow and the storm is only a few hours old, the mayor said, pausing to pick up a candy cane that had fallen from the lobby's Christmas tree. He placed it on a branch low enough for a child or someone in a wheelchair to reach. The state closed the highways within the past hour, the sheriff's deputy said, veering right possibly to avoid standing beneath a sprig of mistletoe, much to the disgust of the naughty elves, if their scoffing behind mercy was any indication. Most bridges iced over last night. It's too dangerous to drive far, and it's only going to get worse. He glanced at mercy. The only thing we're recommending anyone do over the next few days is shovel walkways, yours and your neighbors, if you're able. Otherwise, you stay inside. Mercy nodded. You don't have to tell me twice. She'd stocked up on food and would gladly avoid the snow and icy wind. Miami-born, this was her first main winter, and she was always cold, no matter how many layers she wore. The mayor, sheriff, and several others hurried outside toward their vehicles in what was already looking like near whiteout conditions. I was expecting a few days of quiet after Thanksgiving and before the Christmas rush, Esther said. She owned Esther's house, soon to be a competitor of Mercy's. Esther picked up a snow globe on a coffee table and gave it a good shake, putting Santa and his reindeer in a blizzard much like the one building steam outside. But with so many tourists staying rather than trying to travel home today, and with so many highway travelers looking for rooms, we're fully booked. I've had to turn folks away. Preparing for the cold, Mercy zipped her jacket, wrapped her scarf twice around her face and neck and then tugged on her knit hat and mittens. Esther, a native Mainer, turned to face Mercy. Her gray head was uncovered, jacket unzipped, scarf draped simply around her neck. Are you keeping to your schedule of opening by Valentine's Day? Well, Mercy hedged. She'd been working diligently on the Hollyberry Inn since she began last October. Valentine's Day might be a stretch. There'd been a series of unfortunate events involving ancient plumbing and outdated electrical. I'm farther than I expected to be, but not where I'd hoped to be. Her great-uncle had begun the renovation before he died. Or rather, he'd begun the demolition. He'd done nothing in the way of reconstruction other than doodle his plans on sheets of paper she'd found in the basement. It's the ghost, isn't it? Interest sparked in Esther's faded brown eyes. Is the ghost causing mischief and slowing you down? When your great-uncle bought the place, he swore it was haunted. Mercy scoffed. There's no ghost. Not that anyone ever listened when she told them that. It seemed like the whole of Christmas Town wanted to believe in the ghost of the Hollyberry Inn as much as they did in Santa Claus. Or perhaps this ghost hasn't shown itself to you yet. Chuckling, Esther charged out into the storm, the loose ends of her jacket flapping in the wind like a cape. Mainers. Mercy shook her head, hesitating to follow. Two large, black SUVs pulled under over the river's portico. Those big SUVs were the kind of vehicles one saw pulling up to red carpet events in fancy places like New York City or Hollywood, tinted glass, fancy rims, glossy finish to the paint. Although both SUVs were splattered with slush and blanketed in snow. Let's go see who's arrived. One of the naughty elves linked her arm around Mercy's and swept her toward the main doors to greet the newcomer. A man in his thirties hopped out of the driver's seat and hurried inside. He greeted them with a polished smile. And brought in a whiff of woodsy cologne. Hello. His accent. It wasn't British. It wasn't Australian. It was. He spoke in. The language of love. Mercy did a mental eye roll. 
I am Prince Lucas Friedrich Evander Chanticleer. A prince? Mercy gaped, drinking in the prince's appearance, while releasing the same satisfied sigh she used when she sipped her hot morning coffee. He was blonde, blue-eyed, and handsome. And just looking at him made Mercy feel content, as if her to-do list was manageable, as if she should no longer worry about grand reopenings or what color tile to put in the honeymoon suite. He wore black, shiny dress shoes, glistening with melting snow. Black slacks. A sky-blue sweater that brought out the blue in his intelligent eyes. The black wool coat he wore almost reached his knees. It was the kind of coat men in northern cities wore over their suits. He wasn't dressed for a visit to a small town, to go out in a snowstorm, or to renovate a centuries-old Gothic Victorian. He was dressed to whisk a woman away from her daily cares for a cozy night in front of a fire. The naughty elves closed ranks around him. Struck by an unusual sense of romance, Mercy inched closer to the mistletoe the sheriff had avoided, hoping the prince was in the Christmas spirit. A girl can dream, can't she? Lately, most of Mercy's dreams involved shirtless, hot carpenters swarming the holly berry in with power tools, intent upon putting the old Victorian back together again. I mean, if you're going to dream, why not dream big? But a prince? Even Mercy didn't normally dream that large. There was just something about this prince that didn't intimidate her. He was charming, but also, approachable. Like a neighbor you could rely on, to help you move a heavy piece of furniture. Not charming and unreliable like her father. I'm looking for an establishment with vacancies, the prince said in that deep, sophisticated, foreign accent. My love language. Mercy could listen to that voice all day long, whether he was talking about the number of wooden studs required to repair a termite-damaged wall or the ratio of water to cement when mixing mastic to lay tile. The highway is closed, he with the beautiful voice went on, gaze coming to rest on Mercy with a smile that gave her the same warm fuzzy feeling she got from drinking hot chocolate with extra whipped cream. Pretty powerful, that charm of his. We've contacted every hotel within the Christmas Town region, looking for shelter. But every single one is booked. What about the Blue Spruce? The Loon Country Lodge? Or Frosty Acres? Prudence Parker ticked off options, like a child reciting a well-rehearsed Christmas wish list. Full. Full. And full. The gorgeous man's smile never wavered, never indicated worry or stress. Here was a man who was in the midst of an emergency and hadn't lost his cool. If only he'd been around during what Mercy now referred to as the great mouse nest discovery of Thanksgiving Eve. Mercy sighed. The truth of the matter was that she was alone. There were no hunky construction workers or polished, handsome princes to witness her startled screams when she discovered spiders of unusual sizes and rodents who'd laid claim to the place long before she had. What about the Holly Berry Inn? Odette slid her arm around Mercy's waist with a soft tinkling of bells that rang Mercy's internal alarm. Mercy, didn't you tell us earlier that you had bedrooms finished? Those foreign, beautiful blue eyes turned toward Mercy once more. But this time, Mercy didn't feel entranced. She felt trapped, exposed as a fraud, despite hiding beneath layers of red and green, knitted scarf. Finished is such a strong term. I have walls up, floors repaired, and doors on. But the beds haven't been assembled, Anne. We'll take it, the prince said in a commanding voice, one that lacked even an ounce of charm. There are six of us. Five men and a woman. Mercy's mouth went dry. She wasn't ready for guests, not by any stretch. And royals? They'd have expectations. And in order to fulfill them, she couldn't keep to her construction schedule. Mercy has enough room to take you all in, June reassured him, pinning Mercy with a stern stare from behind those olish glasses of hers, as if she knew Mercy wanted to refuse. Our Mercy's got a big heart, Prudence added, moving in to give Mercy a side hug. And the Holly Berry Inn is full of character. That may have been true, but it was also full of building materials, power tools, 
and an oil furnace she couldn't afford to use above the lowest setting to keep the pipes from freezing. All eyes were on Mercy now, waiting for her to say something. She shrugged deeper into her layers, putting up her guard against royal charm as she reluctantly accepted the inevitable, supposing income would counter inconvenience. Will two unfinished rooms and a bunk room do? He nodded briskly. That will suffice. Respectfully, you don't know what you're getting into, royal hot stuff. I don't have a kitchen, Mercy admitted. The cabinets weren't due in until closer to Christmas. We can make do as long as we have a roof over our heads. The prince was pragmatic. He had an answer for all her attempts to put him off. We will, of course, want discretion. Please don't advertise our presence. The naughty elves held up their hands as if taking an oath. Odette grabbed one of Mercy's hands and raised it as well. Welcome to the Hollyberry Inn, Mercy said as if the inn was finished and up to royal standards. There was no turning back now. She decided then and there to proceed as if the renovations were done. Who knows? They might even give her a good review upon checkout. Mercy made a little curtsy. A bad one if his royal raised eyebrows were any indication. Don't mind the ghost, Odette added. The prince's blue eyes widened. They're joking about the ghost. Mostly. The Victorian had a habit of making noises that Mercy ignored. She gestured toward the door and the thickening snowstorm. Follow me. You went inside an old folk's home and told them you were me? The prince? Yes, I did, Lucas Chanticleer told his cousin, Prince Evander the real heir to the throne. Lucas drove slowly through the streets of Christmas. Town, Maine, following innkeeper Mercy to the Hollyberry Inn. It had been hard to tell much about Mercy. She'd been wrapped in so many layers that only her green eyes were visible, which was why his fascination with her made no sense. From the rear passenger seat, Evan scoffed. You're supposed to be my double for speeches and appearances. Cousin, not for being stranded in a snowstorm. Evan had been in a sour mood since they'd left Verdania, ordered by the king to lay low after another one of Evan's scrapes. The prince could find trouble on a sunny afternoon in a deserted dog park. To avoid more bad press, they'd been sent on a secret diplomatic mission to a backwoods corner of Maine. And as luck would have it, bad luck, that is, they'd arrived in time to be waylaid by what locals were calling the storm of the century. I chose the shock and awe of a royal title, since I doubted you'd want to beg for shelter at the retirement home. Lucas bit back the smile at the image, making the slow turn to follow Mercy along a narrow driveway behind a foreboding, gothic Victorian. His SUV drifted a little in the snow before his tires found purchase. A glance in the rearview mirror showed the second SUV behind him, containing their chef and bodyguard, did the same. We're lucky we have shelter. From the rear passenger seat, Evander's sister Princess Serafina scoffed. Of all the charming Victorians we passed in town, this can't be where we're staying. It's rather, foreboding. I think this is it. Lucas glanced up at the three-story, snow-covered Hollyberry Inn, taking it in through thickening snow flurries and overworked windshield wipers. Snow flurries were coming down so thick and so fast. They were forming a layer of ice on the windshield before the wipers and defroster could clear it off. But from what Lucas could see, the Victorian was black. Shutters hung crookedly next to small windows, one banged in the breeze. Two tall, round turrets rose on either side of the front corners. A wrought iron fence surrounded the property, each segment of black fence emphasized with tall, pointed finials. A statue in the yard was covered in snow and unrecognizable. What is Dracula's castle doing in Christmas Town? Evan demanded, leaning forward over the center console and peering out the front, although given he wore large sunglasses it was doubtful he saw much of anything. Everywhere else we've been in town has looked cheery. Like Santa's home in the North Pole, Sarah added wistfully. She was a romantic at heart. Lucas had to agree with both of his cousins' assessments. 
The innkeeper mentioned she was remodeling. And even though he hadn't seen her face beneath all that knit wrapping, her large green eyes spoke volumes. Those eyes said she had secrets. Those eyes said she wanted privacy. Those eyes said what she hadn't been able to say under pressure from her peers, I don't want you in my home. Little did Mercy know that being the nephew of the King of Verdania meant that most people didn't want Lucas. As seventh in line to the throne, Lucas was used to being unwanted and overlooked. That's why he hid behind a thick layer of charm, to feel a part of things. It was only when he accompanied the heir to the throne that Lucas was seen as having value. He and Evan were similar enough in looks to fool most people. That qualified Lucas to stand in for the prince on occasion. On more than one occasion. Frankly, it was beginning to be on too many occasions, given Evan's severe stage fright. But Lucas couldn't argue. Standing in for his cousin was his duty. The only one, it turned out. This and isn't that ominous. That was Sarah, trying to make the best of things. The snow brightens the shadows. It's the perfect place to stay before our diplomatic meeting with Matteo Santander. Discreet. Private. The last thing we need is the press to find out where we are. You mean where I am, Evan grumbled. It's your fault we're here, Sarah reminded him gently. Where would you rather be? Making speeches at Christmas markets filled with tourists? Presiding over Christmas tree lighting? Ceremonies in small Verdinian hamlets? Saluting the changing of the guard at the palace? Dedicating the opening of a veteran center I raised money for, Evan grumbled, staring out his window. But I can't be there because I'm assumed to be involved in a love triangle with the U.S. ambassador's daughter, which I'm not. I said I believed you, Sarah tried to soothe her brother. But father doesn't. Evan's voice was sharp with disappointment. Neither does the press. There's speculation that I fought for, and won back, my one true love. And now, I've spirited Claudia away for a secret romantic reunion to prove myself worthy of her love. You are worthy, Lucas said with conviction, glancing at his cousin in the rearview mirror. No proving necessary. Evan touched his temple near his glorious black eye and then the stitches running through the arch of one eyebrow, the result of that misunderstanding between the ambassador's daughter and her boyfriend. As if love would ever be worth this kind of trouble. You could tell your side of the story at any time, Sarah pointed out. That earned her a frustrated grumble from Evan. You mean, Lucas would be telling my side of the story. He resented his social phobia, but he couldn't seem to master it. There's plenty of time to plan our next PR move, Lucas said, playing peacemaker. The narrow lane opened into what he presumed was a snow-covered parking lot. It was flat and level. For now, we need to pretend I'm the prince vacationing in eastern Maine for the Christmas. Holiday with his entourage. We need to be merry. Ho ho ho, Evan called out, voice filled with sarcasm. Merry Christmas. Sugarplum cried from her large, covered cage in the rear of the SUV Evan must have woken her up. The rare macaw was a gift from King Leopold of Verdania to Mateo Santander from Spain, a token of thanks for Mateo's help closing a trade deal between their two countries, a deal that would be signed soon, barring any more major social disasters like the one Evan had recently been in. Nuts. Rudolph. Firecrackers. Sugarplum cried. That bird is as out of sorts as I am, Evan said, sounding more like himself. We're all jet-lagged, Lucas said. They'd flown over from Verdania the night before and set out early this morning after landing, destination Bethel, Maine, where Matteo was spending time with his extended family. The bundled-up woman who was their hostess got out of her little red SUV and directed them where to park. And then she made her way toward the back entrance moving carefully up a flight of snow-covered stairs to a door. Shouldn't you have parked closer to the entrance? Evan wiped at the fogged-up window, peering out. It'll be easier for the bellboy and parking valet. This establishment has neither. 
Lucas hadn't told his royal family that their lodging would be less than five-star. Unfortunately, he hadn't imagined how many fewer stars they were getting until he'd pulled up to the dark old house. It had an air of doom and gloom to it. It doesn't look like it has room service either, Evan muttered. We should have stayed in Boston. Where there is much more chance of being photographed? Lucas felt the need to point out the obvious. We've been lucky that you and your black eye have escaped notice so far. Yes. Let's count our blessings. Sarah gathered her things. We have somewhere to stay. Think of this like an adventure. An adventure? Just like all those American horror movies set in creepy old towns and run-down motels. Evan heaved a sigh. Promise me you won't send me to the basement alone when the power goes out. That's the spirit, Lucas said, reminded of the elderly woman's reference to a ghost. He got out of the SUV and was immediately battered by a torrent of large, stinging snowflakes and a strong, icy wind. He opened the rear hatch, then hurried around to the other side of the SUV and helped Serafina to the ground. Her high heels immediately sank into the fresh snow. She flailed her arms, very nearly tumbling over backward, before latching onto Lucas. She took a few extra steps to catch her balance, feet sinking out of sight. Oh, it's cold. She turned and slogged toward the steps where their hostess had disappeared. Evan, bring sugar plum. Let it snow. Let it snow. Sugar plum flapped her wings unhappily in her covered cage. The macaw was vocal and mischievous, even on her good days, breaking out of her cage, exploring nooks and crannies, speaking out of turn. Let it snow, snow, snow. Oh, it's going to snow, all right. Lucas suspected the cage cover would do little good sheltering the bird against the relentless wind and chilling snow. He handed the bulky bird cage to the prince. You and Sarah get inside where it's warm. I'll take Sugar Plum in and then come back to help with the luggage, Evan promised before turning and following his sister's trail through the snow toward the house. It took Lucas and Evan, along with their chef Maxwell, their bodyguard Clint, and the press secretary Albert, several very cold minutes to schlep all the luggage into the rear of the Victorian. It had a breezeway, one big hallway ten feet wide, that went from the rear door to the front door. The decor inside was as dark as it was outside. Black paneling rose halfway up the walls. The wallpaper above it was a soft white, with large black roses in full bloom. At the other end of the hall, there was a grand staircase and a large front door, both also black. It is Dracula's house. Snow, snow, snow your boat, Sugarplum squawked from beneath her covered cage. Voices drifted to them from the other end of the breezeway, followed by the sound of feminine laughter. Down here. I've started a fire. Mercy waved to them from near the front door. And then she was gone, giving Lucas a quick, intriguing impression of blonde hair and a bright red Christmas sweater. Sarah appeared in the place where their hostess had been. Keep your jackets on. Mercy just started the furnace. It's still cold. Then she, too, disappeared. Frowning, Evan blew out visible puffs of air. We're in a house, and I can see my breath. Lucas, Evan turned toward Lucas. This is the best we could get? Yes. It is. Lucas swallowed his annoyance, reminding himself of the stress his cousin was under. And you can only see your breath because we let all the freezing air in. Probably. Hefting Sugarplum's still-covered cage, Lucas led the way toward the other end of the house. He passed a doorway revealing a room that had unfinished walls. And then another. And another on the other side. At the end of the hall, Lucas entered a formal sitting room decorated in black, white, and gray. There were uncomfortable-looking antique chairs and love seats facing a large, grand fireplace accented with what looked like handmade, black tiles. Sarah sat in one chair, bare feet near the hearth, wiggling her toes near her wet, ruined red heels. 
Thankfully, her steady breath produced no puff of condensation. Mercy stepped into Lucas's view, dipping into a curtsy. Welcome to the Hollyberry Inn, Your Highness. Time seemed to slow for Lucas. Mercy was unclassically beautiful and not dressed to impress anyone. And yet, Lucas couldn't look away. Attraction. It had nothing to do with Mercy's body type. She was short and curvy. It wasn't what Mercy was wearing that had him awestruck either. Blue jeans, fuzzy green socks, a red sweater with Santa on it. It wasn't her hair. Short, blonde, flattened by the earlier presence of a knit cap. No. It was none of what Lucas saw or how he normally judged beauty. It was how Mercy carried herself. She had the bearing of royalty. Like she owned and operated a luxury establishment. Like she was the equal to all around her. Like she was comfortable in her own skin. Something I'm not. Lucas hadn't imagined the self-assured woman had been hiding beneath that thick jacket and layers of scarf at the retirement home. But then again, he hadn't imagined the Hollyberry and would look like the setting of a horror film on the outside either. The chill that suddenly worked its way down his spine had nothing to do with the cold or Dracula and everything to do with her. Mercy. Grab a seat closer to the fire, your highness, Mercy said graciously. I wasn't expecting company. Hopefully, we won't turn into icicles while we wait for the furnace to heat up. Call me, Lucas, he told her, introducing the rest of the party, who filed in after him. You didn't have the furnace on? Still watching Mercy, Lucas moved closer to the fireplace where he set the four-foot-tall birdcage down and removed the cover. I assumed you were living here. While renovating the property. Oh, this is my home. The furnace is set on low to keep the pipes from freezing. I live in the basement and rely on portable space heaters. Mercy studied Sugarplum, who was quiet, for once. It wouldn't be economical to heat three stories and a basement just for me. Excuse me. Maxwell caught Mercy's eye. Where is the kitchen? I'm a chef and I'll be cooking for his highness. For me, Lucas realized he'd forgotten to impress upon their entourage that they were traveling incognito. His words earned him many inquisitive looks. I cook, therefore I am, Maxwell deadpanned with a frown Lucas way. Regardless of which royal I cook for. Bodyguard Hank moved around the room, presumably checking window security and looking for listening devices and hidden cameras, all without seeming to take his attention off Mercy. Secretary Albert held his cell phone as if trying to catch a signal. Mary Ho-Ho. Sugarplum flapped her wings, moving closer to the fire on her perch. Oh, he speaks, Mercy cooed, coming closer to the cage. What a clever bird you are. Be careful what you say in front of Sugarplum, Evan said dryly, self-consciously adjusting his big, round sunglasses in a poor attempt to hide his black eye and stitches in his eyebrow. She's a quick mimic. I am royalty. Sugarplum cackled, as if on cue. We're staying at Dracula's castle? I can see my breath. The prince should take his own advice. Lucas had a hard time not staring at Evan accusingly. The prince took the high ground, choosing silence over admission as he sat in an antique chair, posture as stiff as its high back. About that kitchen, Maxwell was nothing if not persistent, which was a welcome distraction from the bird's comments about royalty and vampires. You're traveling with a chef? Mercy tilted her head as she regarded Lucas. I suppose that makes sense. Lucas gave her his most reassuring smile. I should have explained that Maxwell is our chef, Hank is our driver, bodyguard, and Albert is the royal secretary. Evan and I are siblings and cousins of Lucas. Sarah smiled from her seat, already at ease with their hostess. I make sure these men don't take themselves too seriously. Do you have a Wi-Fi password, Miss Mercy? Albert held his phone at the ready. Please. Call me Mercy. She rattled off a password. 
I'm afraid we're going to be snowed in for days. And I'm not one for formalities. Lucas wasn't sure how informality was going to go over with the royal support staff. I still don't know where the kitchen is, Maxwell reminded them. I didn't see it coming in. Oh, you didn't tell him? Mercy glanced from Lucas to Maxwell and then back. I'm afraid I have no kitchen, Maxwell. The chef scowled. And you feed yourself, with a microwave and air fryer downstairs. Maxwell very nearly fainted. Or at least, he staggered dramatically, clutching his chest, as if he might. Say, inacceptable. Sugarplum flapped her wings, sounding just like Maxwell when he got upset. Kel catastrophe. Did she just speak French? Mercy bent to look Sugarplum in the eye. Yes, Evan said. She came very well trained because she's a gift for a friend of ours. That's some gift. Mercy scanned the royal party, as if interested in elaboration. But when none was forthcoming, she didn't pursue it. Lucas added discreet to her growing list of positives. Outside, the gathering storm seemed to growl. The wind rattled the windows. Sugarplum hopped about her cage. I need to see this, kitchen of yours. Maxwell had recovered his chef-like pretension. Of course. Mercy wasn't fazed by the chef's high and mighty attitude. But considering we're snowed in, you might want to order pizza tonight. There's a pizzeria a block east of here, toward downtown. My friend, Georgie, runs the place with her brother and lives in an apartment above it. If she's still making pizzas, we can walk that far in the storm to get it. But tomorrow? Nope. Maxwell's brows lowered. I'd rather walk to the nearest shop in this blizzard than subject royal stomachs to fast food. I'll show you my temporary kitchen. And then you can decide. Mercy smiled graciously, leading their chef out of the room. She was so poised. She must have had experience dealing with difficult people. After that, I need to assemble the beds, so you'll have somewhere to sleep tonight. Maxwell made another disapproving noise. What do you have instead of beds? Sleeping platforms? Beds of nails, Mercy deadpanned. It's the latest trend in acupuncture. And yes, I charge extra for them. Maxwell released a rare shout of laughter, quickly contained. No one spoke after the pair left. Their footsteps echoed on the wooden stairs, then receded. Evan sank deeper into a high-backed chair. Albert, you should have anticipated the storm. This place is... This place is charming. Sarah pointed at where the wall met the ceiling. Look at the crown molding. Black is such a bold, modern choice for a historical building. I suppose you'll be wanting to remodel our ancestral home in black next. Evan removed his sunglasses and glanced around. Perhaps even market our country as a modern-day mecca for vampires. If there was anything in need of a makeover in or from Verdania, it'd be you, dear brother. Sarah went over to Evan and hugged him, softening her words. Isn't this Christmas town? I think Mercy didn't get the memo. Evan sounded more like Maxwell than the caring man Lucas had grown up with. Where's the red and green? The silver and gold? She doesn't even have a Christmas tree. Perhaps she's been too busy remodeling this behemoth to bother with frivolity, Albert said in a rare note of insight. Usually, he kept things to himself and generally was invisible. A muffled cry of distress drifted to them. That's either Maxwell or the ghost. Lucas decided it was their chef and rushed toward the stairs, concerned for both Maxwell and Mercy. This place is haunted? Sarah asked, sounding more curious than shocked. I hope the Hollyberry and doesn't charge extra for apparitions, Evan called after Lucas. Chapter 2 Are you a barbarian? 
Maxwell demanded, scowling at Mercy across the table she used as a makeshift kitchen in the basement. No. I'm a vegetarian. Mercy crossed her arms over her chest and tried to remember that these people were stranded in the midst of a blizzard. They needed her help and hospitality. It didn't matter if they were royalty or not. I don't eat anything with eyes. You have eyes, and yet you cannot see. The chef rummaged in the cardboard box where she'd put what little spices she had. Onion powder. Garlic powder. Italian seasoning. Salt and pepper. No rosemary. No thyme. No plum vinegar. Where are the udon noodles? The chili paste? I suppose if I look in your icebox, you'll have no lingonberries, anchovies, duck, or beef. Again, I'm a vegetarian. No eyes. You'll find fruits and vegetables in my fridge. Just not enough to feed seven hungry people. She should have thought this through before bringing them home. The stores were most likely all closed by now. I've got a stockpile of nuts and quinoa. Maxwell stuck his head in the refrigerator, continuing to mutter in disappointment. What about dinnerware and cutlery? There's Wedgwood china and sterling silver packed in the boxes marked kitchen in the storage room. Mercy texted Georgie, asking if she could order several pizzas for her unexpected guests. That would help stretch the food she'd bought for this week. Footsteps pounded on the stairs and Lucas appeared. I heard a noise. You heard reality setting in. Maxwell marched up the stairs, muttering about cave-dwelling cooking conditions and limited ingredients. Mercy shook her head. Growing up, she'd had experienced plenty of prima donnas, like Maxwell, and wealthy charmers, like Lucas was turning out to be. Contrary to what Maxwell says, we won't starve. That's comforting. Lucas glanced around the basement. Despite knowing small business owners didn't appear on royalty's romance radar, Mercy was drawn to Lucas. Normally, common sense was her superpower. Whatever she felt for him was going nowhere. She knew that. And yet. Mercy took a moment to study him. No one would argue his being attractive. Lucas had thick, blonde hair with a gentle wave that invited her fingers to explore. And yes, his blue eyes were absolutely magnetic and his taste in clothes was impeccable. It probably also helped that Lucas seemed to be the peacekeeper in the group, a role she'd often taken in her family and in business, having learned when to speak up and act versus when to let things go. But, Lucas didn't seem to fit in with the others. Is that because he's the prince? Mercy wasn't sure. Yes, Lucas was well-dressed. Yes, he exuded command. But he didn't seem entitled, like Maxwell or Evan. She could imagine him rolling up his sleeves and getting his hands dirty as he tore down a plastered wall in a certain, gothic Victorian. She could imagine him rolling a push mower over the front lawn in the damp heat of a main summer. She could envision. Actually, Mercy could see Lucas was still engrossed in a visual inspection of the basement. What did the prince see that kept him looking? Her attention shifted. It was dim down here, but dry. Snow was already piling against the basement windows and blocking the light. There was a ginormous storage room at the far end, filled with furniture and boxes of stuff her great-uncle had considered worthy of keeping. Her power tools and other construction equipment were stored near it. There were stacks of flooring along the wall next to three interior, original six-panel doors waiting to be refinished. Swatches of material and wallpaper were piled next to paint, tile and flooring samples on a workbench. Her makeshift kitchen had a microwave and small air fryer, bread, peanut butter, and protein bars. She created a bedroom for herself by dragging bookshelves into temporary walls that separated the washer and dryer from a single bed. In a way, she was living Cinderella's life in the basement, except there were no evil stepsisters upstairs. And, hopefully, no more mice downstairs. 
Suppressing a shiver, Mercy tapped her knuckles on the nearest piece of wood. Sorry about Maxwell. Lucas smiled reassuringly, drifting over to examine the decorative samples on her workbench. It's not your fault, Mercy told him. I shouldn't have agreed to let you stay, but I couldn't bear to think of you stranded in the storm. We're grateful for your hospitality. Lucas absently moved a swatch of gray wallpaper away from a sheet of white penny tile, replacing it with a bold, black and white geometric design. It's always refreshing to stay somewhere different. There was something about his tone of voice. He's lying. Another charmer uttering a different lie came to mind. Mercy, I could never leave your mother, you, or your sister. Six months later, Dad was off building a new life and a new family with a younger woman. Charmers aren't to be trusted. Mercy straightened the spices in her storage box, trying to shut out her father's seemingly sincere voice. We'll need to address the food situation. But even if Maxwell is unhappy, we should be able to get by for the next few days. She hoped. Some sources predicted up to 20 feet of snow in the next seven days. Lucas nodded, gaze shifting to her. In hindsight, when we were at the retirement home, I think you were trying to tell me the house was in disarray. I was. Why don't I show you the bedrooms? Without waiting for his answer, she headed for the stairs. That'll give you some reassurance. The beds are ready to be put together, and I have linens. I can help you with that. Is it bad to say I was hoping someone would? Mercy chuckled, a forced sound considering she was very much aware of him behind her, of that tempting charm which would only lead to disappointment and hurt. Does anyone expect royals to pitch in? I may have royal blood, but I'll prove to you that I can survive in a snowstorm. Let's hope you don't have to prove that. Or anything. To Mercy anyway. They both laughed this time more authentically. After another flight of stairs, Mercy and Lucas reached the second-floor landing. The hallway wrapped around the stairs and jutted down the side wings of the house. Mercy led the way to the most remote set of rooms. Lucas poked his head in one room after another as they passed. It looks like all you need is paint, wallpaper, and furniture. His deep tone and sophisticated accent were more apparent without the noises of others. Home stretch, as you Americans say. Knock wood. Mercy wrapped her knuckles on a wooden door frame as she passed. Every time I think I've tackled all the plumbing, electrical, insulation, and window situations, I discover something else needs to be done, which holds up all the home stretch projects. Do you have a contractor or a designer? His interest warmed her. I'm both. She entered the first bedroom. This is one of your rooms. I've named it the Stripes Room. It's a double. Mercy was proud of this room. In keeping with the Gothic theme, she painted the wainscoting black. The wallpaper was a wide, black and white striped pattern. Two mattresses and two box springs were propped in a corner next to two antique bed frames she'd whitewashed. It's got its own bathroom. Mercy had finished that the week before Thanksgiving. It was completely white, white marble countertop, white clawfoot tub and shower curtain, white penny tile floor. This will do. Lucas nodded briskly before sweeping his hand through the air and sweeping his intense blue gaze back around to her. Is there a reason for the black and white color scheme? After all, this is the Hollyberry Inn and Christmas Town. Are you against Christmas? I have nothing against Christmas. Mercy's gaze drifted skyward as she double checked the ceiling for mistletoe. Of course, there was none. Why couldn't the stars align and provide a sprig of mistletoe when she was with a man she wanted to kiss? Because the ghost of Christmas present knows what's good for me. And that isn't a royal charmer. Sighing, Mercy sought more professional footing, both in tone and by backing toward the door. My great uncle bought this place with a vision. He wanted to set the inn apart from other Christmas themed establishments in town. 
As you saw in the basement, he purchased bulk quantities of black and white finishes. A gothic mood for a gothic Victorian. Lucas nodded. Exactly. Unfortunately, he didn't leave notes as to what went where. And Mercy had agonized over making design decisions, while she was certain her sister and mother would have hardly given the choices a second thought. Stay in your lane, Mercy. And I'll stay in mine. That had been Mercy's sister. Mercy loved Mary, but her sibling was territorial and that had been a driving factor in Mercy's choice to embrace the challenge that was the Hollyberry Inn. She led Lucas to the next room, which had white wainscoting and black wallpaper with white Christmas wreaths. She put black tile and black paint with white fixtures in the bathroom. This room is the larger of the two and can probably fit three of you. I call it the wreath room. I'm afraid I'm not that imaginative name-wise. Mercy tried to laugh, but it was hard admitting all her weaknesses to a prince. She cleared her throat instead. This room is big enough to accommodate families. I ordered a pull-out sofa, but it hasn't arrived. I'll bring in. Inflatable bed in here tonight and put it in the corner. Again, there were two mattresses propped against the walls with whitewashed bed frames on the floor nearby. Lucas glanced around. This isn't the bunk room? It has enough space for bunks. The bunk room is a historical feature. It's just down the hall. Mercy led him into a room the size of a large walk-in closet. It had the original, built-in bunk beds, a small, built-in desk, and a cubby with a compact sink squeezed next to a toilet. I'm told the original owner, the one who built the house over 100 years ago, used to rent out the bunk room short term. It's not much. Even my great-uncle couldn't decide what to do with it. It was the only room not demolished down to the studs. The wood bunk still had the original brown stain. The bath fixtures were ancient. I've toyed with making it into a second utility room or linen storage, but, she shrugged. Please note that there's no shower for Sarah. It almost looks like a railway sleeping car. Lucas walked to the narrow space between two sets of bunks. Except the facilities have no door. He gestured toward the toilet, then looked at her. Privacy costed extra back then, I suppose. Mercy was caught by his smile at her joke, unable to squelch a burst of joy that smile caused from the inside out. Although, I've always thought this room would be perfect for a little girl's slumber party. Don't limit it to tiny princesses. His smile turned mischievous. This is perfect for a band of boys, too. A posse of princes. Mercy was too charmed by him to censor her own silliness. A parade of princesses. I see what you did there. Lucas' blue eyes flashed with appreciation. Does he think I'm flirting? Mercy was out of practice handling charmers. She sobered. Alliteration. Very clever. He studied her the way a locksmith studied a knob for which there was no key, wondering how best to open things. Mercy's father had once studied her like that. Of course, that had been right before he'd amped up the wattage of his smile, told her not to worry, and promised everything would be the same between them after the divorce. The breaking of that vow had left Mercy touchy when she sensed she was being charmed into believing a lie. Is he going to lie to me again? The way he had about it being refreshing to stay at a place less luxurious than he was used to. It was time to get back to business. I have a mattress to bring up here for Sarah. Lucas didn't seem to notice the formality in Mercy's change of subject. This is far better than sleeping in our SUVS Plus, each room's got a radiator. It'll be warm in here soon. Lucas gave Mercy one of his grateful smiles. He was quite good at giving smiles of all sorts. Unexpectedly, he reached out and laid a hand on her shoulder. Just a touch that made her heart race, before dropping it away. Thank you again for taking us in. I don't think Maxwell's attitude will improve, but we're all truly grateful to be out of the storm. 
As if on cue, the wind held outside, making the loose, third-floor shutter bang and adding to the tension in the room. Mercy forced herself to take a deep breath, to seek calm and solace from charmers. Yes, she was drawn to the prince. Lucas was very insightful. And forthright. A good leader. She could respect that. Respect him. Was it your idea to pull up to the retirement home earlier? He nodded, staring into her eyes as if searching for something. I was going to ask if there were any vacant rooms with the elderly. But then I found you. But then I found you. Mercy shouldn't dwell on those words. But she had a feeling she'd keep them close to her heart long after this prince among men was gone. Lucas went over to investigate the small window that needed reglazing, the one Mercy had framed with duct tape to keep out the elements. The space allowed her to breathe easier. You took on this house all alone? he asked, still looking out the window. Yes. My great uncle was something of an eccentric and bought the house after it had been vacant for decades. Mercy ran her hand over the fine woodwork on the door trim. As a carpenter and then a contractor, she appreciated the detail put into the trim. He died last spring. And I, I was looking for a challenge. The house popped and groaned, as if to say it wasn't going to make things easy for her. What was that? Lucas turned, alert. Not the ghost. The heat is starting to creep upwards. And Gertrude, that's what I call the house, Gertrude is any elderly woman. When the weather changes or I turn the heat on, she feels the temperature change in her arthritic joints. Another sound reached them, this time a human protest, you've got to be kidding me. Mercy thought she recognized that voice. Is Maxwell always so, particular? I'm afraid so. Lucas nodded, running a hand through that thick, blonde hair. You won't complain about his drama once you taste his food. I'll take your word for it. Mercy's phone buzzed. It was Georgie, offering to make as many pizzas as needed. In the meantime, what kind of pizza do you like? Where did you learn to put a bed together? Evan asked Lucas after a pizza buffet dinner that night, one that included a green salad made with iceberg lettuce that was served on a set of antique china. That salad was so plain, Maxwell had turned up his nose at it, refusing to let anyone eat until he'd added fruits and vegetables from Mercy's refrigerator and made his own dressing. I think what you mean to ask is where I learned to use tools. Lucas tightened a screw attaching a bed rail to the antique headboard in the stripes room. Remember how I took that gap year before finishing university? I went to Africa to build homes for underserved. Communities. Ah, uh, that rings a bell, Evan said absently, holding the headboard steady for Lucas. He'd stuck his sunglasses on top of his head, revealing that nasty purplish black eye and the angry red skin around the six stitches in his eyebrow. You weren't available to stand in for me for some time. Lucas took a beat, not quite hurt, not quite not. They may have been family. They may have grown up together. But sometimes, Evan could be a stereotypical, self-centered prince. It was during those times that Lucas reminded himself that Evan was under more stress than Lucas was. That earned him a pass. I've never put a bed together. Evan let the headboard flop and nearly drop. Have you? No. I looked up the instructions on my phone. Lucas gestured for his cousin to hold the headboard still. It seems very basic. What if Mercy looks us up on her phone? Evan frowned, probably thinking about the latest scandal he'd been involved in with the U.S. ambassador's daughter. Not all of my pictures online look like you. What if she does? Mercy seems the type to mind her own business. She didn't bombard them with questions. She was very trusting, not even asking them to register or insist on a form of payment. She hasn't asked anything about Verdania. Your Highness. Albert entered the room, bowing stiffly before extending a cell phone. 
The king is trying to reach you. Releasing the headboard, Evan slipped his sunglasses back on and took the phone from Albert. The headboard would have fallen if Lucas hadn't lunged forward and grabbed hold of it. Albert moved into Evan's place, holding the headboard steady. You shouldn't call the prince by anything other than Evan or Evander while we're in America, Lucas gently chastised Albert. Albert was too well trained to roll his eyes, but his stare implied he was giving Lucas a mental eye roll. Perhaps you'd do better to advise Maxwell about protocol than me. Touché. There was a knock on the door. Mercy stood in the doorway, arms filled with linens. I've got towels and bedding. Mercy hurried into the bathroom to deposit the linens, then joined Lucas at the bed frame. Let me help you finish. Albert seemed glad to leave them to it. Together, Lucas and Mercy made quick work of preparing the sleeping quarters. They didn't talk much. Despite not being open for business, Mercy made beds efficiently and with military precision. Sarah poked her head in to ask where she'd be sleeping. She dragged a suitcase upstairs. Mercy led the princess to the bunk room, quickly returning with an apology for leaving Lucas to do work alone. You probably aren't used to making beds. Mercy's hand brushed past his as she smoothed the comforter over a bed corner. Adrenaline shuddered through Lucas as if he'd touched a badly wired set of Christmas lights. Their eyes met. Held. Lucas was certain Mercy felt the same connection he did. Her cheeks flushed an attractive shade of red. But she moved long before he did, tugging the bedding smooth, then running a hand over the coverlet. We got lucky when we bumped into you, Lucas blurted. This is much preferable to sleeping at the retirement home. I don't know. Mercy smiled, fluffing pillows. The naughty elves would have taken good care of you. The naughty elves, Lucas was finally able to move, circling the other side of the bed and adjusting the already smooth linens. You probably don't remember the three elderly ladies who were there when we met, June, Odette, and Prue. Is she speaking faster? Do I make her nervous? The thrill of attraction made him feel like a teen again. The naughty elves knit and they matchmake. Mercy laughed self-consciously. They probably won't matchmake a prince. Ah, yes. She was speaking faster. And that was nervous laughter. She wasn't as unaffected as she pretended. This could be something real. I bet you wouldn't have had to make your own beds at the retirement home, Mercy continued, still speaking at a brisk clip. And they have a fully stocked kitchen at Over the River. Maxwell would be the only one of us who'd be happier, Lucas said with certainty, because he would have missed this. Her. What did you do before the inn? Lucas asked as they walked slowly toward the stairs to join the others in the sitting room. I was a licensed contractor for my family's construction company in Miami. Mercy glowed with pride. They build and renovate high-end, custom homes for old money, foreign princes, music moguls, and the like. She was accomplished in construction and dealing with high-profile clients. Lucas was impressed. You must be well-suited to a project like this. The construction part isn't a problem. It's all the Mercy waved her hand at the nearest wall and its black rose wallpaper, taking the first step on the staircase. It's all the design stuff. My mother and sister never let me do that. When I was a kid, I was more interested in banging a hammer than selecting the right tone of paint for a south-facing room with a view of the water. She gave him a tentative look, as if his next words would decide whether they got along or not. Is the correct answer white? Lucas made a guess. Mercy's green eyes widened, and her expression turned into one of mock horror. Do you know how many shades of white there are? Too many to count. He grinned. My mother spent the month of July one year with paint swatches in the kitchen. I don't exactly have a month to decide, Mercy admitted, a rare flash of worry evident in her eyes. An odd sound drifted to them from somewhere in the house, somewhere that was hard to pinpoint. Not to mention, the sound was. 
Lucas didn't know what that sound was. It sounded like a woman's voice. Mercy didn't flinch. She just kept walking down the stairs. Did you hear that? Lucas asked as they reached the first floor landing. Uh, no? Mercy's smile wasn't convincing. She hurried into the sitting room. Lucas followed at a slower pace, looking around and listening, recalling one of the naughty elves saying there was a ghost here and Evan's comment about it being a fitting setting for a horror film. Was there someone locked up in a room somewhere? Almost immediately, he rolled his eyes, rejecting the idea. Did you hear that noise? Sarah asked when Lucas entered the sitting room. She'd changed since their arrival and now wore a pink silk sweater, white slacks, and comfortable-looking fur-lined slippers. Did you two make that noise? Lucas decided to let Mercy answer. I'm almost 100% certain it's Gertrude. Mercy took a poker and spread the embers of the fire. Lucas's traveling companions exchanged curious glances. Wait. Lucas was jet-lagged, but he thought he remembered. You mentioned Gertrude before. He couldn't quite remember when. Mercy nodded. Is there someone else in the house? Hank moved to the edge of his seat, ready to get up and make sure Gertrude wasn't a threat. Gertrude is my name for the house, Mercy said apologetically. I told Lucas that earlier. You heard the house shift and creak when we were in the bunk room, right Lucas? He nodded, finally remembering. Yes, but you said you're not 100% certain it was Gertrude just now and... The sound repeated itself. Lucas pointed back toward the hallway. That doesn't sound like a house settling. It sounds like a living thing. Sarah nodded. I suppose I should tell you, Mercy poked at the fire some more, causing sparks before returning the metal tool to its hearthside hook. When my great-uncle bought this house, the locals told him all kinds of ghost stories about it. They all leaned forward, eager for the tale, even Lucas. He may not believe in ghosts, but he enjoyed folklore. Mercy tucked a lock of short blonde hair behind one ear and stood, like an actor comfortable taking center stage. Local legend has it that a benevolent spirit, known as the guardian angel of the Hollyberry Inn, watches over inhabitants. Mercy swept her hand through the air, as if to encompass those assembled. If the stories are to be believed, she ensures their safety and happiness, especially during the holiday season. Many attribute mysterious occurrences, such as lost items, unexplained sounds, and sudden gusts of warm air on cold winter nights, to the presence of the inn's celestial protector. The fire popped, startling them all. Except Mercy. Again, Lucas attributed it to lack of sleep and jet lag. Mercy shrugged. Anyway, I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe in wood joints creaking as the ground beneath the foundation shifts or the temperature inside changes. I've replaced a lot of studs and beams in this house. It's natural that the new and the old test joints settle and test each other, causing some noise. I'm the ghost of Christmas past, Sugarplum warbled, cutting the tension in the room and eliciting laughter. The parrot preened. Gertrude, the angel. That's me. How long have you lived here? Evan asked. Since October. Mercy took a seat near Sugarplum, smiling at the bird. And I haven't come face to face with any spirits yet. Not once. Evan nodded. Good. Of course, after putting in twelve hours or so of work every day, I sleep like a log, Mercy admitted and I sleep in the basement where it's harder to hear. Well, I hope Gertrude doesn't groan anymore or I'll be bunking with you, Mercy. Sarah stood and headed for the stairs. It's been a long trip. I'm going to bed. Here's some advice for running a successful inn, Mercy, Maxwell said, getting to his feet. Don't tell ghost stories right before bed. You didn't you hear the part about her being a guardian angel? Mercy teased. I heard. The chef stomped upstairs. Evan, Albert, and Hank followed them. 
Lucas lingered, not ready to say good night. There was something about mercy that spoke to him, but he only had a few days to translate that message before they went their separate ways. Mercy took the poker and spread the coals further apart. Then she took the accordion hearth grate and fitted it in front of the fireplace. You can go on up. I need to wait a little more for the fire to die down. She turned her back on him, seeming to stare into the fire. An odd noise sounded again, more distant this time. Outside, the wind rattled the windows and set that loose shutter banging. The occasional footsteps sounded upstairs, along with the intermittent, indistinct murmur of voices. Still, Lucas didn't move. Not at first. But then his feet were intent upon closing the distance between himself and Mercy. He touched her arm. Mercy? She glanced at him expectantly. Yes, your highness. My name is Lucas. He hadn't meant to sweep Mercy into his arms, but it seemed natural. Mercy? She laid her head on his shoulder. Yes, your highness. He wished she wouldn't call him that. But it was a cold reminder of his duty, to prince, crown, and country. Lucas eased back, gently lifting her chin until their eyes met. I was just coming over to say thank you. For everything. And to stare deep into your pretty green eyes. And, about me being a prince. Don't tell her. I didn't do it, Sugarplum said, making Mercy jump. It's not fair. Mercy drew a breath. You'll be leaving soon, your highness. Yes. Despite duty, despite logic, Lucas drew her closer once more and whispered, You feel it, don't you? Her green eyes flared. That was all the encouragement he needed. I've been all over the world and I've never been struck by this sense of. Knowing, she whispered back, sliding her hands over his chest, coming to rest on his shoulders. I'm not the kind of person that happens to. I'm like, her hand wavered back and forth. I was going to say a wallflower, but I feel like that implies someone quiet or flowery. And neither describe you. Agreed. She smiled. A small smile. A careful smile. A smile that conveyed what he didn't want to hear. But what does knowing each other matter? When the snow is cleared in a few days, you'll go on traveling the world. But I'll still be here. In Christmas Town. Her words were wise. Yet didn't quite temper his feelings, or that knowing he very much wanted to pursue further. Mercy turned her gaze toward the fire. You need to take Sugarplum to your room, just to make sure she's warm enough tonight. And there it was. Another reminder that his royal bloodline superseded all else. Still, it took Lucas several breaths to bid her good night and leave her. Chapter 3 Wow. You've been busy this morning. Mercy took in the breakfast buffet that Maxwell had prepared with sinking spirits. He'd used entirely too much food given they were snowed in. And you made coffee too. That took the sting out of his raiding her larder. At least, they had enough coffee to last the week. Bed and breakfast, indeed. Maxwell scoffed, fiddling with the arrangement of serving dishes he'd laid out on two tables in the sitting room. You slept in mercy. Because she'd been unable to fall asleep, brain dissecting what had happened between she and Lucas until the wee hours of the morning. You were up early raiding my food stores. Mercy poured herself a generous cup of coffee. And pointed out what for her was obvious. You know that food has to last us several days. Haven't you looked outside? We're snowed in. The snow drifts were at least ten feet tall, reaching above the windowsills in the sitting room. He'll put in a food order as soon as the shops open today. Lucas sounded confident but didn't look Mercy's way. He wore the same business casual clothing today, expensive loafers, unwrinkled slacks, soft gray sweater. 
He sat by the fireplace in which someone had made a small fire, looking at home. But this isn't his home. Lucas had unsettled her last night when he'd said good night. Not a creepy unsettling, but a comfortable unsettling, if there was such a thing. As if they were meant to be in each other's space. As if he turned on the charm because he liked her, rather than being like her father and using his charm to bring about a conclusion that suited him. A prince turned on the charm because he likes me? That was too hard to believe. The feeling of connection must have been a fluke. Where royalty was concerned, mercy was, and always would be, the help. She glanced around the sitting room. There was no need of a fire today. The furnace was working almost too well. For once, Mercy was warm in her frosty the snowman sweatshirt and blue jeans. Was this what it was like to live like a royal? Making fires without needing it for heat? Making fires when it wasn't a holiday? That would explain why the mansions I built in Miami had fireplaces. I've started a shopping list. Maxwell continued to rearrange the small buffet, as if presentation was everything. Dude, it's just fruit, energy bars, and quiche. Get a grip. A sudden need to burst Maxwell's bubble had Mercy moving to the window and pointing to a snow drift that reached the sill. How do you expect to get more food? Didn't you receive an emergency text message this morning? The snowplows are only going to try and clear the main roads today. The bomb cyclone may have passed, but the next storm is due at any time. The authorities are asking everyone to stay inside. And from what I heard yesterday, the stores won't open for at least another day or two. Maxwell's brows lowered. I am duty-bound to uphold the standards of the crown. Which includes having enough food for everyone on the table, I presume. Mercy wasn't about to be intimidated. Princes don't live on coffee alone. I saw a snow shovel in the basement. Maxwell rolled his shoulders back. Your pizza friend told me it's only two blocks past her place to the nearest shop. I'll clear a path. If the shops aren't open, we'll have an easier go of it tomorrow. The man wasn't to be deterred. I'll help shovel the front walk, Mercy offered without much enthusiasm. She had planned to work on the third floor today, but chances were that the noise of a nail gun would disturb someone in the royal party. Better to start from the front porch, since it's sheltered. The back porch is snowed in. She'd opened the rear entrance door before entering the sitting room and the snow was above the doorframe. I shall persevere, Maxwell insisted, nose in the air. The greatest chefs always do. That's the spirit. And Mercy didn't mean Gertrude. Has anyone seen my watch? Sarah entered the room, looking ready for lunch at a posh country club in her cream silk blouse, tan sweater, and blue slacks. Oh. What's Sugar Plum doing out? Sure enough, the parrot had perched on the fireplace mantle. Merry Christmas. Ho 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 ee why. The parrot tapped a black and white teapot with her beak pushing it toward the edge. Mercy moved closer to the mantle, extending her hand like an olive branch. Her former project manager took her to a bar in Miami that had a large bird like this. Mercy had seen its owner encourage the macaw to perch on his hand in the same manner. Sugar Plum stepped onto Mercy's hand, inching sideways until she settled on her wrist. Good girl, Mercy told her, easing around and walking toward her cage. I heard noises last night. Sarah poured herself a cup of coffee. Did anyone else? I couldn't hear a thing over the jet plane of a storm roaring outside. Lucas stared at Mercy. What about you, Mercy? Same. Mercy extended her arm toward the open birdcage door, trying to encourage Sugar Plum back into her safe space. I am royal. The parrot fluttered its green and red wings and climbed further up Mercy's arm until she reached her shoulder, seemingly reluctant to return to her cage. Merry Christmas! Mercy eyed the bird. Now I feel like a pirate. What would our names be, Birdie? 
Captain Mercy Nutcracker and her loyal parrot Sugarplum the Fierce. I am a pirate. Sugarplum turned and reached for Mercy's small silver earring. No Mercy covered her ear. Bad bird. Sugarplum took one of Mercy's fingers gently in her beak, almost immediately releasing her finger. Captain Sugarplum. Captain? You're too big for your britches, Sugarplum. Sarah went over to a window. I've never seen so much snow. Not even at home in Verdania. Verdania? Why did that sound familiar? Mercy couldn't make the connection. I must confess not knowing where Verdania is. She tried to encourage Sugarplum to step off her hand while covering the ear closest to the bird with her other hand. But I've dealt with enough royalty via my family's construction firm in Miami to know that there are many small countries in the world that I've never heard of. Here comes Santa Paws, the parrot sing songed, clinging to her perch on Mercy's shoulder. Santa Claus Sugarplum Lucas came to Mercy's rescue, taking the parrot gently in hand and putting her back in her cage. Then he straightened and looked at Mercy with the same knowing smile he'd cast her way last night. Like I'm his person. He wasn't laying on the charm. He wasn't grinning like he had a secret and she could kiss it out of him if she dared. He was just being himself. Oh, my. He was charming, but nothing like her slick, salesman father. Mercy's cheeks heated. She cast about for something to say. Anything to say. Lucas was a prince. He probably looked at all his subjects that way. Best eat and get to shoveling. Mercy darted toward the buffet and a black and white patterned china plate with silver trim. She was determined to severe the dangerous attraction between them. Dangerous, because he could win me over and then break my heart when the snow clears. Coffee. Evan entered the room, eliciting a round of good mornings from everyone. He wore those big, round sunglasses, like a movie star from the 1970s. I knew I smelled coffee. May I make you a plate, your Evan? Maxwell sounded stilted. Why would that be? Is he in love with Evan? Not that there was anything wrong with that. But if it was unrequited love, that might explain Maxwell's touchiness regarding his inability to wow Evan with his culinary talent. Poor guy. I'm curious, Mercy. Sarah settled on a black and gray, rose-patterned love seat. Why hadn't you put furniture in the finished bedrooms before we arrived? There's an entire room in the basement filled with furniture, lamps, odds and ends. Mercy loaded her plate with food. I've been too busy making sure each suite is finished and the bathroom's functional to move in furniture or put up Christmas decorations. That wasn't completely true. Decorating involved making a choice. A design choice. And once a choice was made, judgment could begin. Is the basement full of antiques and such? Sarah asked, a spark of interest in her eyes. And Christmas decorations too. Mercy nodded. If you'd like to poke through the room, go right ahead. We could probably use some Christmas cheer in here. In their bedrooms, too. My great-uncle wanted this in to be different, but I suppose it can't ignore Christmas altogether. Even if Mercy was so overwhelmed that she couldn't think about the approaching holiday this year. She caught Lucas's eye and smiled. He'd given her that idea with his comments last night. It is part of Christmas Town, after all. I adore antiquing and decorating, for Christmas and every day. Sarah cradled her cup of coffee and stared happily toward the fire. We may be snowed in, but I'll be content with a task ahead of me. I am Captain Royal. Sugarplum weighed in. With eyes made out of coal. The royal entourage laughed with varying degrees of amusement. Mercy continued putting food on her plate, picking through the fruit bowl while giving her guests covert glances. They all had royal bearing, carrying themselves with sophistication embellished by high-end clothing. 
The only item that wasn't high class was Evan's big, round sunglasses. It might have been Mercy's imagination, but it seemed as if Evan had a black eye. She didn't want to look too closely. And yet. I'll help the snow shovelers, Lucas offered, placing a chocolate energy bar on Mercy's plate and blocking her view of Evan. That's probably the only exercise I'll get today. She nodded, wondering if Lucas had meant to distract her. Because he was distracting, that hair, those eyes, his lips. I'm grateful for the help, Maxwell said, inclining his head slightly. But I will lead the charge to food. As you should, Evan acknowledged absently. Which was an odd thing to say. But then again, hosting a prince at the unfinished Hollyberry Inn was odd, too. The stinging cold struck Lucas first when he stepped onto the Gothic Victorian's front porch later that morning. Mercy stood at the edge of the porch where there was no railing, just a large wall of snow, presumably covering the front steps. She was bundled up the same way she'd been yesterday beneath a thick tan jacket, a blue knit cap and mittens, and a red and green knit scarf, leaving only those expressive green eyes showing. Just looking at her made Lucas smile. He knew some of her secrets now, her partially finished in, her determination to tackle a huge renovation alone, her intimidation of the numerous design choices she faced. Not that Mercy would ever truly let anything or anyone put fear in her heart. She was gutsy, not backing down from anyone. Not even a fake prince. Mercy handed a snow shovel to Maxwell. I'll let you do the honors of the first shovel. Trust me, Mercy. I'll do the majority of the work. Maxwell hefted the tool with gloved hands. He and Lucas had donned the ski wear they'd brought, pants, jackets, hats and gloves. It is my duty to shovel, not yours. Have you ever shoveled snow before? Mercy asked, narrowed green eyes betraying her cynicism. No. Wish me luck. Maxwell drew the snow shovel back, then plunged it into the tall drift of snow covering the stairs. Before Lucas or Mercy could wish the chef anything, Maxwell plunged after the shovel headfirst into the snowbank. He spasmed, and then sank. And sank. And sank. Holy ice melt. Mercy moved faster than Lucas, grabbing hold of Maxwell's legs and dragging his limp body to the porch. Maxwell, are you all right? The chef didn't answer. He crumpled onto the porch like a scarecrow released from his post, shovel clattering beside him. Lucas and Mercy eased Maxwell onto his back. Blood. Mercy scrambled to Maxwell's shoulder and gently brushed snow from his face with her mitten. He's got a cut on his forehead. She pressed the palm of her mittened hand over the gash. There's blood on the shovel, too. He must have banged against it in the drift. Here. Lucas removed Mercy's hand and set his gloved one in its place. He'll need a bandage. Do you have a first aid kit? Yes. Mercy hurried inside. Maxwell. Lucas patted the chef's cheek with his free hand, trying not to panic. Maxwell was a bleeder. Wake up. Can't you let me sleep? Maxwell mumbled. I woke up to my own personal torment this morning. No gas stove. No proper oven. And the spice rack? Pitiful. Blood seeped through Lucas's glove, but he was heartened by Maxwell's ill humor. Most likely, the chef would be fine. At least, Lucas hoped so. Beware of the snowdrift, Maxwell continued mumbling. It wasn't as hard-packed as a bomb cyclone promises. The door behind them burst open and Mercy rushed out with a large first-aid kit but without her gloves or scarf. Is he still unconscious? I would never, Maxwell squinted at Mercy. Pass out. Stop shining a light in my face. Who do you think you are? Frosty the Snowman. Mercy referred to the character on the green hoodie she wore under her tan jacket. She opened her med kit. 
Don't worry, Maxwell. I'm going to fix you right up. Were you a doctor in a past life? Lucas asked. We know she wasn't a chef, Maxwell jabbered. She's a vegetarian. I'm not a doctor or a nurse, Mercy said patiently opening a gauze square and dousing it with antibiotic. But I've had first aid training and been in charge of many a job site. I've wrapped up cut appendages, broken bones, and messy head wounds. She pressed a gauze pad on Maxwell's cut, eliciting a wince from her patient. I bet you've nicked your fingers plenty of times in the kitchen, chef. Not near as many times as I bet you have, Maxwell groused. Once the bleeding stops, I'm giving the shovel another go. What is it you Americans say? Rain, sleet, snow and hail won't stop you eating burgers and fries. That's pretty close to the U.S. Post Office's motto. Mercy checked beneath the blood-soaked gauze, revealing a large, red lump. Once the bleeding stops, you're going to sit by the fire with an ice pack on your head and with your feet up under Albert's watchful gaze. She turned to Lucas. Concussion watch. Agreed, Lucas said, as if she'd been looking to him for confirmation. All in all, he was feeling rather unnecessary. Like a true prince. Lucas didn't like it. I will not shirk my duty, Maxwell intoned ominously. Consider it a well-deserved vacation. Mercy kept up her banter with Maxwell during her ministrations, wiping the blood from his face, gluing the cut closed, applying a butterfly bandage. She was fabulous. She'd be fabulous in the royal realm where each day required resilience and good humor in the face of duty and knowing your place. Several minutes later, they had the chef in a chair by the fire feet propped up and Albert watching over him while Sarah and Hank rummaged around in the basement looking for antiques and Christmas ornaments. Evan entered the sitting room with an ice pack. His sunglasses had slid down his nose. You need to take it easy, Maxwell. That's right, Lucas seconded. Dr. Mercy recommends rest. Thank you, Mercy. Maxwell's eyes were closed. And thank you to Prince Evander for the ice pack. Prince Evander? Mercy stilled, staring at Lucas and then at Evan and his purplish-black eye accented with black stitches in his eyebrow. There's more than one prince among you? Everyone in the room went silent. This was where resilience was required. Although it was reluctant resilience on Lucas's part. Yes. Lucas nodded, rolling his shoulders back. There's me. Prince of Verdania. Lucas Friedrich Evandris Cuthered Chanticleer. And there's my cousin Prince Evander Friedrich Archer Eldred Chanticleer IV. Boom. The electricity went off. Chapter 4 Prince Evander, Mercy's head spun so fast it felt like it imploded, boom, making her vision dim. Even Mercy had heard of the playboy Prince Evander, a man who was rumored to be part of a high-profile love triangle. She must have heard Lucas wrong just now. Maybe he meant to introduce him as Prince Alexander. Boom. Boom. Wait. It wasn't her head that was imploding. That's, Mercy whirled around, racing to the windows, although given the amount of snow piled up and falling, she couldn't see anything. That's a transformer exploding. The power just went out. That explains a lot. She laughed, almost giddy with relief. I must have misheard you, Lucas. I thought I heard you tell me that Evan was the notorious Prince of Ander. I did, Lucas said in that deep voice with that soft accent that made Mercy weak in the knees but now her knees were weak for a different reason. If he's the playboy prince and you're both from the same country, Mercy turned and faced her guests, faced the man who'd called himself prince. I've never heard of a prince Lucas. Lucas looked apologetic. He lied to me? No. Mercy drew a belabored breath. All those lingering looks, those soft touches, those knowing smiles. Boom. She ignored the Transformer crisis, too wrapped up in her own drama. I've been charmed to see what he wanted me to see. 
You're not royalty, are you Lucas? For the first time since meeting him, Mercy felt overheated from anger, not attraction. I'm of royal blood, Lucas said quietly. But I'm not the heir to the throne. He just stands in for me when the cameras are around, Evan said unhelpfully, removing his sunglasses and revealing stitches in his eyebrow, black thread accenting his colorful, swollen eye. We're cousins, but we look like twins. Mercy didn't think so. If she'd only looked closer, she'd have seen the truth. She'd have recognized the international royal, taken note of that black eye and stitches, and made the connection to what she'd seen in her social media feed. Merry Christmas Prince Evander, Sugarplum squawked. Then she whistled the notes of a cat call. Such a pretty boy. The playboy prince, Mercy murmured, tugging at the neck of her green hoodie because she needed to cool off. The pair of royal, lying faces swam before her eyes. Light-headed, Mercy walked over to Maxwell, took his ice pack and laid it on her forehead. But the world didn't come back into focus. I feel like such an idiot. You were gushing about how kind I was to take you and Lucas. Going on and on about a connection but... But only because you didn't want me to look much closer at any of you. I'm such an idiot. You're not an idiot, Lucas said quietly, calmly, with a trust-me look in his blue eyes, one she wouldn't fall for again. We are truly grateful for your hospitality. I told you I was a prince too, keep me in the dark. Mercy moved the ice pack to the back of her head, trying to put things in perspective without losing her cool. People lie. And she'd been hurt by those lies before. I can't let this whopper of a lie get to me. As a future innkeeper, she had to have thicker skin when it came to liars. Her guests wouldn't always be truthful to her. She had to heal that wound her father's lies had made. She had to stitch it up and learn not to be so sensitive about it. That's doable. Yet, she felt like a fool. Not because I was lied to, but because I was charmed and lied to. It was an echo of her father's dishonorable behavior. You wouldn't know this, Lucas, she admitted, staring at the black and white flower pattern on the hearth rug. But I avoid charming liars, like I avoid sending physical Christmas cards every year. Why subject myself to someone, or something, that's only going to be tossed aside in a few days? Ouch, Evan murmured. I deserve that mercy, Lucas said quietly. Sincerely. Mercy refused to look at him, afraid she'd slid back down that slippery slope of charm. Outside, the snow clouds thickened, blocking out more of the sun and sending the sitting room deeper into shadows. That's right. The power is off. A good innkeeper would have already done something about it. I need to make a phone call. Mercy handed the ice pack to the wounded chef and patted her outer jacket pockets, searching for her cell phone. Who are you calling? Lucas asked sharply, coming to her side. Whoever I like. Mercy found her cell phone in her inner jacket pocket. She tugged it out and opened the screen. The thing is, Lucas took Mercy's arm and guided her to the smallest love seat, which was also the most uncomfortable. He placed a hand over her phone. I know we betrayed your trust with a ruse, but we don't want anyone to know we're here. Mercy stared at his finely manicured, unscarred hand and the gold insignia ring on his pinky finger. Who does he think I'm going to call? The tabloid press? That's right, Mercy. Evan came to kneel before Mercy, no longer the stick-in-the-mud celebrity hiding behind outdated sunglasses, but a man who wasn't afraid to show her his battered and bruised face. We're on a diplomatic mission to deliver Sugarplum to a political ally. And we need to keep a low profile. Mercy's gaze drifted to the birdcage. The door hung ajar. Sugarplum escaped again. On it. Evan hurried out of the room, gaze swinging to and fro. Mercy, did you hear me? Lucas said gently, hand still covering hers on her phone. We don't want any press or social media. Like I have time for either. I was going to call, you don't need to call anyone, Lucas said, still gently, but now firmly. Not even pizza girl from across the street. Mercy's cell phone rang. The cold of betrayal had begun to set in, moving deep into her bones. It's my best friend. A person I trust. Lucas stared at her, understanding dawning on his face, she no longer trusted him. He removed his hand. Georgie. Mercy answered the phone. Did you hear those booms? 
I sure did. The transformer on the pole above my shop blew. Georgie sounded annoyed. I called it in. I was going to call the power company, too, but some incognito royals from Verdania had a panic attack and stopped me. You beat me to it. The power company says it'll be at least two hours before the power comes back on, not that I believe them. Georgie sighed. I had a big food delivery two days ago, one I'm regretting now. I'm worried it's going to spoil by the time our roads are clear and folks want pizza again. Are you and your guests hungry? Evan walked back in with Sugarplum on his shoulder. Bad boys. Bad boys, Sugarplum crooned. Whatcha gonna do? She whistled the rest of the tune. Georgie, Mercy blew out a breath. How about I shovel over to your place and relieve you of some of that food? My hero, Georgie gushed. Not pizza again, Maxwell moaned. Is that the rude chef I hear? Georgie demanded. The one who picked up pizza with you last night? Yes. Don't worry. I won't bring him. Mercy hung up. Shushed Maxwell. Tucked her phone in her coat pocket and stood. Pizza, Maxwell lamented. Why did it have to be pizza? Her guests were all watching Mercy, waiting to see what she'd say or do next. Like I know? Or maybe, she did. Her ornery jean was kicking in. Put a sock in it, Maxie. Mercy caught Lucas's eye. I'm allowed to sass Maxwell, aren't I? He's not a prince. Lucas and Evan chorused, of course, while Maxwell protested vehemently, no. Maybe you should slow down, Lucas told Mercy the third time she dumped snow on him. Boy, was Mercy angry. She charged outside with a pair of leather work gloves after silencing Maxwell and the rest of them with her spunk. Lucas liked Mercy this way. Not angry per se, but alive with emotion and not afraid to let those feelings loose on the world. If only those negative emotions weren't targeting me. Mercy was shoveling snow like a well-oiled, fully charged snowblower, tossing snow high up and over the snow drift until he'd cautioned her to ease up, worried she might miss swing or fall. And what had Mercy done? She'd begun tossing the snow behind her and on Lucas's head with a speed few could match, as if this was her version of whack-a-mole and she was going for a high score. I have a job to do, Mercy ground out, thrusting her shovel into snow at her head level, then tossing it over her head at him, adding a layer of snow to the thick carpet already coming down. I need to have enough food to feed a prince and his royal entourage. Lucas brushed the snow off his head and shoulders. I'm sorry. Truly. I didn't mean to deceive you. It's just that we're traveling on a top-secret, diplomatic mission with a notorious royal rake. I get that. Really, I do. Mercy thrust the shovel into the snow, yet instead of tossing it at Lucas, she turned to face him. Her cheeks were the color of ripe red apples, and her green eyes flashed like the green grass of spring. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at me. Lucas drew back. Why? I spent most of my life idolizing my father, who was a charmer and local royalty in the sense that he operated in the posh social circle of Miami's wealthy and well-connected residents. I loved him and thought he could do no wrong. Mercy was breathless from exertion, but she wasn't done. He and my mother built a thriving contracting business in Miami, catering to the luxury end of the market. My father is a charmer, the life of the party. He was my favorite person. My best friend. I followed him everywhere. Because of him, I grew up on job sites. First cleaning up, then doing demolition, and finally learning how to read plans and build something beautiful and lasting. There was pride in her voice and confidence in her eyes. For a moment, at least. But then, when I was in high school, I noticed my father acting. Let's just say he didn't seem to be honoring his wedding vows. Pride and confidence drained from her, drooping her shoulders. Hurt furrowed her brow. I confronted him about it. He said it was nothing. Salesmanship. Smoke and mirrors to land a new client. She scoffed, not noticing when Lucas took the snow shovel from her. He smiled with that charmer's grin. He hugged me while whispering all kinds of lies. Six months later, he served my mother with divorce papers. And I, I lost my father and my best friend that day. I couldn't trust anything he said after that. 
Lucas ran a hand down her arm and gently clasped her fingers in his own. I'm sorry. When I announced myself at the retirement home, I only did it as part of my security duties. I understand, Mercy said softly. It's not you, it's me. Like I said, I'm angry with me. Lucas frowned, sensing she wasn't telling him everything. Because you believed I'm a prince? Mercy shook her head. Can we just let this go? We haven't even reached the street yet. She tugged her hand, trying to free it from his grasp, although her efforts were minimal, at best. And her eyes. Those fabulous green eyes wouldn't look at him. There's a lot more snow ahead of us. And a lot more words ahead of us, too. Lucas brought her hand close to his heart, acting on instinct. Tell me. Tell me how I've hurt you. So he'd know how to make it right. Her cheeks flushed a deeper red, nearly matching the color of Santa's red suit. Lucas let the snow shovel clatter to the frozen ground at their feet, using the hand that was now free to cradle her cheek with his palm. You feel it, don't you? That connection between us? Mercy's gaze flew to his, giving away the truth, before it ever crossed her perfectly kissable lips. Yes. And that makes you angry. Not a question. An observation. Yes. Her expression became guarded. I can't believe I'm saying this. But yes. You connected with something inside of me, something I wanted to ignore but, couldn't. He tried to catch her eye, to give her a reassuring smile, before realizing that might reinforce the wrong message. I couldn't either. Mercy blew out a breath, creating a puff of visible air between them. I admit, I fell for your practice charm. But I'm not going to do anything about it. Why would I? You're only here for a few days. Not to mention, we're incompatible. I mean, look at me. I work power tools and plan to run a bed and breakfast for a living. And you? You're, she glanced around furtively, not that they could see anything in their tunnel of snow. Even so, when she continued, she lowered her voice. You're a royal of some kind. Whatever, curiosity, you fell toward me, she broke free of his touch and grabbed hold of the snow shovel handle as if she needed to take hold of something that wasn't him. It was an honor for you to acknowledge the attraction was mutual, although if you'd just kept quiet, I wouldn't be burning with embarrassment right now. I wouldn't be, Lucas grabbed hold of Mercy and kissed her. Right there. A mere twenty feet into the yard. If anyone stepped onto the front porch, they'd see them. Lucas held nothing back. And he wasn't disappointed. Mercy melted against him and made a small noise, a noise that reminded Lucas of Gertrude settling, but on a softer, gentler scale. Their kiss flowed. Their kiss warmed. Their kiss promised. What, he wasn't sure. Mercy was right about one thing. Lucas couldn't promise her anything. He couldn't even promise to be here for Christmas. Lucas broke off the kiss, more unhappy than he'd ever been about his lot in life. His duty was to the crown, not to his heart. A feeling built inside of him, warm in his chest, then growing hotter, like one of the old strings of Christmas lights his grandmother used to have, big bulbs made long ago without a safety shield, ones that sizzled skin if touched. And that sizzling feeling was the truth, trying to burn its way past his practice defenses, his, his charm, as Mercy would put it. My life isn't my own. Here Luke's was. Thirty years old. Unable to commit to a woman who wasn't part of the royal world he'd been raised in, unable to settle down and build a home of his own, unable to turn his back on his lot in life. My duty. The need to forge a new life, one of his own making, raced in his veins, banging against invisible guardrails on a circular track. Perhaps that was why he admired Mercy so much. After leaving her family's business in Miami, she blazed her own trail. Adrenaline pumped through his veins, demanding he exit the racetrack that went nowhere. But it was a futile rebellion. Lucas knew his place. There was more at stake than his happiness. His parents would be disappointed. His king. His cousin. Mercy stood as if frozen, eyes closed, one hand still gripping the snow shovel. Snow fell around them, big flakes dotting her blue knit cap and her dark lashes. I'm going to remember this moment until the day I die. Lucas wanted to kiss her again. Tried to rationalize how unfair that was to them both. 
failed, began to draw her close. Mercy drew in a deep breath and opened her eyes, placing her free hand on his chest. There'll be no more of that, your royal. Mr. Sir. Knight of the realm. No more of her sweet kisses? Why did she have to be the strong one? We'll see, he said. Mercy brought out something inside of Lucas that longed to be his own man. Lucas took the snow shovel from Mercy and gently prodded her out of the way. Then he began shoveling snow on top of the drifts to either side of their tunnel. The snow fell softly around them. After a few minutes, Mercy could be heard scraping her boot across the ground, presumably to clear the snow she'd thrown at him from their path. I shouldn't have tossed snow on you, Mercy said in a composed tone of voice. I'm sorry. Prince or no prince, if I'd have done that in your homeland, Hank probably would have me locked up in a jail cell by now. He's not just your driver, is he? No again, Lucas was impressed by her powers of perception. I accept your apology for pelting me with snow, Lady Mercy. She scoffed, lightly though, as if amused. Lady Mercy. And just like that, a truce was made. They'd worked their way out from under the trees and nearer the sidewalk. The snow was wetter and harder packed now. More like an ice wall than the soft drift Maxwell had fallen into. Lucas paused, leaning on the shovel, sweating. Remind me again why we're shoveling snow when it's snowing and only going to dump more on our handiwork. Because of food. Georgie has food for many while I only had food for one, most of which Chef Maxwell already cooked. Food. I don't suppose Georgie has dessert. Something sugary would lift his spirits about now. Mercy didn't comment right away. But when she did, it was surprising. What is your favorite dessert? That was easy. Blueberry pie with a crumble top. Hot out of the oven with a scoop of vanilla ice cream. And you? Anything with whipped cream and strawberries. Her voice was as wistful as a melting snowflake, as if she hadn't had such a simple thing as whipped cream and strawberries in far too long. Why was that? Why had she left Miami for a small, snowbound town in Maine? Did she enjoy watching sports of any kind? Did she ski? Did she have holiday traditions she cherished? There was so much Lucas wanted to know about Mercy, so much he wanted to share about himself with her in return. And logically, as Mercy had so astutely pointed out, a relationship wasn't in the cards for them. But his heart. His heart wasn't ready to believe it. Lucas shed his jacket, giving it to Mercy, before returning to the task at hand. Why did you leave your family business in Miami? I thought it was obvious. My great uncle died and left me this house. Obvious? It felt easier talking to her when they weren't looking at each other, when her lips weren't within easy reach. You could have sold the house. You don't like snow or the cold. You mentioned something about this renovation being a challenge. And something else about the daunting number of shades of white. Mercy blew a raspberry. No one in Verdania blew raspberries in the presence of a royal. Lucas grinned. I told you that my family serves a very high-end clientele. Our clients demand luxury and style. When my sister came into the world first, my mother showered her in girly things. Me, on the other hand. The doctor predicted I'd be a boy. My room was done up in blue. And from the very beginning, I was daddy's girl. I was wielding power tools while other girls were dreaming of kisses in middle school. I rather like that power tool story. Because it meant Mercy hadn't pined after another, at least not in her younger years. The idea of her kissing someone else, even innocently, made him jealous. Lucas jabbed the snow shovel forward. It encountered thick, nearly impenetrable ice. He leaned into it, going nowhere. You like that I know how to use power tools? Is this royal small talk? Mercy eased Lucas aside, took the shovel, and attacked the ice from above, as if slicing off pieces of a yule cake. Now, my sister... She tagged along with my mother to design meetings. They shopped together for materials to go into kitchens, living rooms, and bathrooms. Even though I wanted to explore the design side of the business, it was as if they'd built an invisible wall between construction and design. Mercy shifted her grip on the shovel and undercut her cake slices, as if preparing to serve them on her shovel. You were in a silo. 
Lucas retook possession of the shovel and mimicked her technique with greater results. Boxed in. He knew how that felt. Exactly. And last year, I was looking for a way to spread my wings. My family, my mother and sister, told me in no uncertain terms that I don't have an eye for design. What about your father? Is he still in the picture? Lucas was in a rhythm now, one not interrupted by their conversation, slice from above, slice crosswise, lift and toss, repeat. Oh, he's still around. Mom knew better than to lose the company's dealmaker. It sounded like Mercy kicked her snow boot against the wall of snow, crunch. And just so he wouldn't get any ideas about jumping ship, Mom and Mary are always upping their game, design-wise. Hench your workbench with combinations of color and pattern. Yep. I've got stacks of design magazines in there, too. Makes it near impossible for me to make a decision. Crunch crunch. She kicked more snow. It fell around his feet. My great-uncle ordered everything he wanted to finish the hollyberry in. I don't know if that makes everything easier or harder. When I arrived, his materials were in boxes without any design plans. And trying to figure out what goes where is like trying to solve a complex algebra equation without knowing the value of x. Lucas paused, wiping the sweat and snowflakes from his face. You think your construction skills make you less qualified to be a designer than your sister and mother? Yes. That explains so much. Lucas turned to face Mercy, hoping she wouldn't notice that he'd curved their snow trail such that no one could see them from the Victorian, inside or out. That explains why you feel you aren't good enough to fall in love with me. Love? Now you're trying to charm me. Mercy frowned. It's not possible to solve for X when Y lives in another country. I'm not charming you. I'm speaking from the heart. Lucas heard the gruff note in his voice, felt the words strain as they pushed past his suddenly narrow throat. As a royal, it's my job to present my country and my family in the best possible light. But it's a veneer mercy. If there's anything I've realized in the past 24 hours, it's that I don't need it when I'm with you. Her mouth formed the sweetest little O. Lucas set down his shovel, then looped his arms around Mercy, drawing her where she was meant to be, with her lips close, and her eyes staring into his. Sometimes, the things we assume are obvious are the very assumptions we should challenge. And then Lucas kissed her. Because he had to. They were both undervalued by their families. And even though Lucas had no plans to stay in Christmas Town, he couldn't ignore the special connection between them because there was a chance, no matter how slight, that it could lead to something more, something real. Something he, as seventh in line for the throne, had never had. His own destiny. Chapter 5 You made it! Georgie cried when Mercy and Lucas broke through the last bit of snowy ice wall that separated them on the sidewalk, hours after they'd begun. I'm so glad you didn't bring the stick in the mud. Georgie, this is Lucas. My, guest at the inn. Mercy's cheeks were heating, and she couldn't look at Lucas directly. She hadn't thought about what she'd call him. They'd shoveled snow. And kissed. Shoveled more snow. And kissed. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Until she was no longer bothered by the cold, and they reached the shoveled walk in front of the chimney stack, home of Georgie's pizzeria. What's come over me? Mercy wasn't the type of woman who met a man and 24 hours later let herself be kissed senseless, much less by royalty who would continue his secret diplomatic mission as soon as the roads were cleared. But he'd admitted his charming facade was all part of the role he played, a role he no longer played with her. I hope it never stops snowing. Great pizza last night, Georgie. Lucas turned on the charm. And I love your Christmas decorations. Georgie had painted her windows with a scene featuring Rudolph and the abominable snowman, then framed the windows with colorful lights, and put a Christmas tree in both front windows. A Christmas town native, Georgie had gone all in on the holiday the week before. Thanksgiving. Kind of made Mercy feel bad about her lack of Christmas anything at the Hollyberry Inn. Voices could be heard further down the block. Snow kicked up in the air as if someone was shoveling to reach them. Hello? Georgie called, turning. Is someone there? It's the Christmas Town Fire Department, a man shouted back. Lucas set to work shoveling snow to connect the approaching man on the sidewalk. 
He's something, Georgie whispered to Mercy, waggling her brows beneath her knit cap. He's something, all right, Mercy whispered back, grinning. A few minutes later, the snow crumbled to reveal Stefan Adamatus in his navy blue EMT uniform, a blue knit cap, and a heavy blue jacket. Behind him, his girlfriend Tabitha set down what looked like a pair of tackle boxes, but were probably medical kits. The snow swirled around them, rushing through a long stretch of wind tunnel that spanned from the Hollyberry Inn to Main Street. Hey Mercy. Georgie. Stefan smiled. I'm part of the fire department's efforts to check on folks. And I brought baklava. Tabitha swung her backpack to the snowy ground, removed two small cardboard takeout containers, and gave one to Georgie and one to Mercy. She grinned at Lucas. Have we met? No. I'm staying at the Hollyberry Inn. Lucas introduced himself without his long list of names or his fake title. Are you a doctor? He directed his question to Stefan. Emergency medical tech. Stefan's gaze turned assessing. Are you feeling okay? Yes. But a friend of mine at the inn fell earlier and cut his forehead on the edge of a snow shovel. Lucas drew Mercy close. He passed out and Mercy patched him up, but I'd appreciate it if you could have a look at him. Sure. That's why I'm out. Stefan nodded curtly. The sound of a large, grumbling engine reached them, seemingly coming closer. That would be the town snowplow and the electric company's repair truck, Stefan explained. We should get off the sidewalk. All that snow on the street is going to go somewhere. Shoulders sagging, Lucas gestured back the way they'd come. Please tell me we won't have to reshovel our path back. You might, Stefan told him. But I'll help. Phew. That's a relief. Lucas passed a hand across his brow. They took shelter in Georgie's pizza parlor, which was warm and smelled like fresh pizza. The snowplow went by, pushing snow onto the shoveled sidewalk and narrowing the passageway, but thankfully not covering it up completely. Soon, a large, metal basket with a technician in it was extended over Georgie's rooftop toward the blown transformer. While Georgie packed up food for Mercy, the rest of them returned outside. You look familiar to me, Lucas. Tabitha studied his face. Have you been to Christmas Town before? First time, Lucas said, tucking his knit cap lower on his blonde head. Give the man his space, Tabitha. You've probably seen his doppelganger. Stefan laughed without knowing how close to the truth he'd come. We've got to go. Man down at the Hollyberry Inn. He tromped off, taking the tackle-like boxes and leaving his snow shovel. Tabitha followed Stefan through the snow tunnel. Meanwhile, Lucas was texting with lightning speed and whispered to Mercy. At some point, we'll have to acknowledge our presence here. In my experience, one person recognizing us means the end of incognito. Mercy sighed, murmuring, and the end of kisses. The food has arrived, Lucas announced, balancing food boxes in his arms while holding the door open for Mercy and Georgie to enter the Hollyberry Inn. All three of them were loaded down with boxes and bags of food. The snow was thickening outside, and they were all winded. Great. The food is here but I can't cook, Maxwell complained from the sitting room. Because the power is still out? Lucas shut the door behind them, setting his boxes on a bench near the door. Then he reached for Mercy's burdens. I've got it, she told him. Gone was the smiling woman willing to kiss him. This Mercy was all business. She walked on, not even shedding her boots and jacket. Lucas wanted snow shoveling Mercy back. Maxwell can't cook even with electricity. Stefan boxed up his equipment. Six stitches and a concussion. No wielding sharp knives or operating appliances until he's cleared. No cooking? That's too bad Maxi, Mercy teased, walking past the sitting room and toward the stairs leading to the basement. Such a shame, Maxie. Georgie paused to survey her food nemesis. You'll have to make do with Mercy and my cooking. Is that pizza girl? Maxwell muttered as Lucas came to stand next to her. Wonderful. Now we're all doomed to gastric boredom. Canned sauces and prepackaged pastas. Say, inacceptable. Sugarplum hopped across the back of the settee Maxwell rested on. Cal catastrophe. 
Georgie gaped at the macaw, and then at the rest of the room. Lucas stared, too. It had changed considerably since they'd left. An artificial Christmas tree had been put up by the front window. Sarah was rummaging through a large cardboard box, while Hank was untangling a strand of white lights. Stefan's girlfriend, Tabitha was zipping her backpack closed. I'm with you, Georgie. Even my grandmother's authentic, Greek baklava recipe wasn't good enough for this chef. Thankfully, getting her nose bent out of shape seemed to have cured Tabitha of her royal curiosity. Perhaps because Evan and Albert were nowhere to be seen. Gone, just like my chance for more kisses from Mercy. I've never tasted better baklava Tabitha. Lucas walked Stefan and Tabitha to the front door. And the food Mercy makes will be fine. That's a bold statement Lucas, Maxwell said ominously, raising his voice from the sitting room. You'll sing a different tune in a day or two. Lucas ignored the surly chef, grabbed the boxes of food from the bench and headed downstairs after Mercy and Georgie. Battery-powered LED lanterns were scattered around the basement, providing a surprising amount of light. Sarah had followed him downstairs and pushed past him. Mercy, Hank and I found a big box of new ornaments that are black and white. We brought them upstairs, but I wanted to check with you before I put them up on the tree and elsewhere. They fit the gothic vibe of the Hollyberry Inn, but it's a definite choice. My great-uncle Russell is constantly surprising me. Mercy blessed the princess with a golden smile. Of course, you can use them. It's what he would have wanted. Thank you. It's going to look beautiful. Sarah turned to go. Wait, Sarah. There's something else Mercy needs help with. Lucas schooled his features in a carefully neutral expression because his next words could be taken the wrong way. Mercy's trying to foster her own sense of style and design. Maybe you could give her some to help provide guide rails for the suite she has yet to finish. Oh, Mercy made a small sound, looking small herself. That's not necessary. Mercy has great taste, Georgie said staunchly. I'm not saying Sarah should make decisions for you. Lucas was quick to correct that impression, moving closer to Mercy. I think what Lucas is trying to say is that I can give you some rules of thumb to consider. Sarah struck just the right compassionate note. I'd recommend you whittle down your choices by focusing on what speaks to you. I don't want to put my stamp on your in. If I did, I wouldn't have asked you about those Christmas tree ornaments. Well, then. Yes. That would be nice, Mercy allowed, looking relieved and more like herself. Thank you. Lucas kissed Mercy's temple. Georgie gasped. Oh. How sweet. I should head back. She hugged Mercy and scurried toward the stairs. Text me if you need anything. I owe you, Mercy called after her. Sarah was staring at Lucas and Mercy. Mercy's cheeks bloomed with color. She moved away from Lucas. I should unpack this food. That's your cue to give Mercy space. Sarah dragged Lucas upstairs to the sitting room. Canned food is the worst, Sugarplum cried, still hanging around the back of the settee Maxwell sat on. Lucas picked up Sugarplum and returned her to her cage. That's a good girl. I'm a royal, the parrot told him. Shoo, Lucas told the bird. That's a secret. I'm a royal, Sugarplum repeated. Maxwell huffed. A royal pain in the heart. Sarah began unpackaging black and white ornaments. Sugarplum has a lot of heart, Maxwell. And she rolls with the punches better than you do. Their chef groaned. Try living a day without the one thing you're most passionate about and then we'll talk. Sarah frowned at him as if she had and had endured. The power flickered back on. Perfect timing. Hank plugged in the tree's white lights, bringing the tree to life. What do you think? He looked at Sarah and only at Sarah in a way Lucas hadn't noticed him do before. Excellent. Sarah glowed at their bodyguard. You must have done this before. It's gorgeous. Hasn't everybody strung Christmas tree lights before? Maxwell sniped. You'd think Hank prepared a twelve-course meal. Sometimes you're too cranky even for me, Maxie. Hank walked out. Maxie. Maxie. Sugarplum cried. 
Sarah considered Maxwell with a gaze that promised retribution. She and Hank were close. Maxwell, I don't think you heard. Tomorrow, Georgie's going to bring a special pizza just for you. I think she called it everything but the kitchen sink. Oh, goody. Maxwell groaned as Sarah made her exit. Squid with bacon and broiled cherries. Sugarplum tested the latch on her cage. Yum. Evan and Albert entered the sitting room, glancing around as if looking for something. Is it safe? Albert asked in a circumspect voice. Are the commoners gone? Yes. All clear. Lucas assured them they now had enough food to weather a week of storms and explained Maxwell's prognosis. Look, Maxwell. Evan bent down before the chef. We match. My stitches. Your stitches. My black eye. Your. I do not have a black eye, Maxwell said in his most pompous voice. They all laughed. Because their chef did indeed have a shiner forming. Soon, he'd be a mirror image of his beloved prince. Chapter 6 Can things get any worse? Mercy muttered to herself later as she prepared dinner for the group in her makeshift basement kitchen. She chopped potatoes into long slices with a vengeance she couldn't unleash elsewhere. Why on earth did I kiss the man seventh in line for the Verdinian throne? There was a sound on the stairs. Lucas helped Maxwell over to a chair near where Mercy worked. I don't need a royal audience to make dinner. And it wasn't Maxwell she wanted out. She'd kissed Lucas to her heart's content out there in the snow tunnel. But now. She had regrets. Mercy put French fries in her air fryer, set it to roast, and then placed the vegetable soup Georgie had given her in the microwave. She had frozen ham and cheese paninis waiting to be cooked for the royals on the other side of the table. Also a Georgie contribution. Green salad would round out their dinner, but with bottled dressing this time. This crew were big eaters. Think of me as quality control. Maxwell's gaze was unfocused, and he wore Evan sunglasses, as if the light bothered his eyes. There was little chance of him seeing and judging anything he hadn't put in his mouth. And I'm the referee. Lucas had taken a chair from the storage room and brought it over to sit in. Is this a Montgomery? He bent to study the chair more closely, tipping it up and glancing underneath. It is. How'd you get this? It's very valuable. My great-uncle was the founder of Montgomery chairs. He made that one by hand. Mercy chopped lettuce for a salad. His style was inspired by the European medieval era. Each piece has a hidden compartment, but he never indicated where. We have some of his work at the King's Castle in Verdania. Lucas began inspecting the chair more closely, poking and prying. I'd forgotten about the hidden compartments. I know that sound. Iceberg lettuce again, Mercy? Maxwell moaned. Did the pizza girl not have spinach? Couldn't we have gotten to the shops when the plow cleared the road? Mercy almost relished the chef's complaints. Bickering was preferable to mooning at the fabulous kisser in the room, the one examining one of her great-uncle's chairs. The stores aren't open, and the plows were only being used on the main arteries and where there were power. Outages. Did you look out the window? There's already another two feet of snow on the ground. Hey. There's a hidden drawer under the seat. Lucas cried excitedly. Mercy smiled, imagining Lucas as a little boy on Christmas morning, opening packages with exuberance, even if all he received were socks. I suppose it's empty. No. There's an old journal. Lucas held a small, worn, leather-bound book in his hands. And look at the title. The Hollyberry Inn. He showed her the gold-embossed letters on the front. Inside were yellow pages and wide, precise pen strokes, as if made with a quill. Lucas flipped through, reading what seemed like titles. A History of Our Journey Begun 1895 by the Landertingers. Why We Chose to Settle in Christmas Town. How the Hollyberry Inn Came to Be. A Few of Our Favorite Holiday Recipes. The Story of My Beloved Guardian Angel, May She. Rest in Peace. Lucas lifted his gaze to Mercy's. The guardian angel is real. 
The house chose that moment to settle with a familiar, feminine groan. Was her name Gertrude? Mercy didn't wait for an answer. She opened the microwave and stirred the vegetable soup. Lucas flipped through the pages. No. I think, he peered at the pages while Mercy set the soup to heat for a few more minutes. I think her name was Florence. I would have eaten microwaved goop without complaint if it had been Gertrude, Maxwell griped. I mean, what are the odds? Sorry, I'm mistaken. Lucas winked at Mercy. Florence is the author's name. The guardian angel is named Gertrude. I could love this man. Maxwell flinched in his seat. I just tried to roll my eyes and practically blacked out. Do not mess with me like that, sir. I wouldn't dream of it, Lucas assured him, again with a conspiratorial smile, sent Mercy's way. But you did promise to eat without complaint. Every day while you're concussed, Mercy added. The things I do in the service of my country, Maxwell muttered. Fine. But if there are any recipes in that thing, I want first crack at them when I'm well. Agreed. And because the chef was finally being a good sport, Mercy gave him one of Georgie's homemade breadsticks along with her special dipping sauce. Try this. I promise it isn't frozen or from a can. Mercy, I think you need to read this. Not that Lucas extended the journal to her for a look. He had his aristocratic nose buried deep in it. Why don't you read it for me while I finish making dinner? That way, Mercy could listen to the soothing sound of his voice and enjoy it now that Maxwell had been quieted, silenced by Georgie's delicious breadsticks and dipping sauce. This journal is fascinating. Lucas hadn't relinquished it since he'd discovered it in the Montgomery chair. I have to assume your great-uncle read it. I think he must have. Mercy took a seat next to him. She'd been making sure everyone's food was warm, that they all had utensils as they sat around the table in the basement on an odd assortment of Montgomery chairs. While she served them, Lucas had been reading tidbits from the journal aloud. Everyone was enthralled. Did you know there's a Christmas rose planted by the front porch? Lucas asked. Yes. The naughty elves told me it was poisonous. Mercy filled her spoon with soup. I plan to take it out. Lucas tapped the journal page. You can't do that. It's called a Christmas rose because it only blooms during the holiday season. Mercy nodded. But it's unwise for a bed and breakfast to have a poisonous plant on the premises. But, Lucas tapped the page again. It says here that Lewis proposed to Florence by plucking that first bloom of the holiday season. That's a romantic selling feature for the Hollyberry Inn. That rose would come in handy if one of us was involved in a romance, Evan said in mock seriousness. We all happen to be single. Mercy gave him a dirty look. But since the prince was occupied with dunking his breadstick into Georgie's dipping sauce, Mercy didn't think he'd noticed. Tell me again about the story of Gertrude. Mercy stirred her soup, taking in the bright colors almost the same way she admired the brightness of Lucas' smile. I was too busy preparing food to catch all the details. And she still didn't quite believe Lucas wasn't pulling her leg about the girl's name. Gertrude. Your Victorian's namesake, Lucas flipped a page. She was Louis and Florence's youngest daughter. Everyone loved her. It says here she'd sneak out of her bedroom, early or late, delivering food, medicine, and clothing to those in need in Christmas Town. She sounds a lot like you, Mercy noted, holding her spoonful of soup midair, while he held her gaze in a way that made her heart pound harder. Taking care of everyone. Lucas' gaze dropped to her lips, but only for a moment. She, uh, died falling out of a tree she was climbing, coming home after sneaking out. To meet a lover? Maxwell asked. Hardly. She was twelve. Lucas flipped the pages of the journal, then showed them a sketch. Lewis made this drawing of her and then had a statue made. It's the one in the garden. The Christmas angel that watches over guests. Mercy's gaze softened as she remembered the delicate statue in the backyard. There's a plaque at the base of her statue. It says Gertrude, our Christmas angel. She's the ghost that helps find lost items? Maxwell stirred his soup. My nail clippers are missing. Add that to my missing watch. Sarah served herself more salad. But legends of ghosts aside. 
Mercy, the Holly Berry Inn has a great history. Much more interesting than staying at one of those big chain hotels. Lucas grinned. Maybe Mercy shouldn't mention things go missing. That has nothing to do with Gertrude, Mercy insisted, finally realizing she'd been too preoccupied watching Lucas to eat. She filled her spoon with soup once more. He tapped the journal. It says right here that Gertrude helps heal the weak and find what is lost. If she was twelve when she died, she might have had a mischievous streak. She might be responsible for those items that go missing. Everyone at the table groaned. Mercy silently sent up an apology to Gertrude. Sugarplum flew down the stairs and landed on the back of Mercy's chair. I'm here. Merry Christmas. She extended her beak toward Mercy's ear. Mercy shooed her back. Not my earrings, Sugarplum. I think Louis Landertinger was from Verdania. Maxwell tore a breadstick in half and dumped it into his bowl of vegetable soup. The menu they had for Christmas is from our country. Pickled herring and liver pâté were very popular a hundred years ago. The other dishes were popular across Europe, too. If Lewis was from our country, our visit here would be fate. Lucas captured Mercy's gaze. And she felt caught by the truth in his words. Call it an instant connection. Call it fate. There was something between them that was hard to deny. Chapter 7 Sarah, I can't thank you enough. Mercy walked down the stairs with the princess a few days after their arrival at the Hollyberry Inn. Mercy had grout under her fingernails and paint in her hair, but she'd never been happier. Christmas Town had been hammered with snowstorms all day, every day, since the royals had arrived. The main roads had been plowed, but the state highways were still impassable, having too much snow for them to be kept clear. Life in most of Maine had come to a standstill. But not for Mercy. You've taught me how to use color and texture that I like. Mercy had been so afraid to break the design rules. But Sarah had taught her that there are no rules. And you convinced the guys to help me with installation. That would be another story to add to the legacy of the Hollyberry Inn. Members of Verdinia's royal family were painting, tiling, and hanging wallpaper. Even Hank and Albert had contributed when Sarah had asked them to. And Sarah? She'd been digging through the stored furniture and dragging out pieces to put in bedrooms. Mercy was going to make a Valentine's Day opening after all. All I did was give you the confidence to believe in yourself, Sarah told Mercy. A message echoed by Lucas. Mercy felt her cheeks heat. She'd been trying to keep their romance low-key, but they'd been caught kissing more than once. Anyway, I'm grateful. And hopeful Maxwell will get his medical clearance tomorrow. I knew it, a familiar, grumpy voice greeted them from the sitting room. You do want me to cook again. Only because I don't like to cook for so many people. Especially not when they were meat eaters. Mercy entered the sitting room. In just a few days, it had been transformed into a stylish winter wonderland. The Christmas tree with its white lights, black and white ornaments, and glittering silver star. The windows with white rose wreaths Sarah had made from silk flowers she'd found in the storage room. They had gorgeous black satin ribbon accents. Sarah had also found white brocade pillows with black stenciled Christmas trees. Do you like it? Sarah came to stand next to Mercy. More and more every day. That's how Mercy felt about Lucas, too. Can we talk to you about something? Sarah glanced toward the staircase. The rest of the men were painting bedrooms on the third floor. About Lucas? For the record, I voted not to talk to you. Maxwell adjusted his sunglasses and settled back on the white pillows on the settee. It's none of our business. Mercy felt small and vulnerable. But she stood her ground. She'd been waiting for someone to point out there was no romantic future for her and Lucas. Say what's on your mind. We've all noticed you and Lucas getting close, Sarah began. It's hard not to when we're in such close quarters together. But... Captain Sugarplum. The parrot strutted into the sitting room as if she owned the place. Merry Christmas. Mercy went to help the bird return to her cage, waiting for Sarah to continue. And waiting. 
The elephant in the room is that your life is here, and Lucas has a life with us in another country, Maxwell stated the obvious, much as he'd claimed to want to stay out of it. And you think Lucas and I haven't known this from the moment we acknowledged there was something between us? Mercy went light on the sarcasm because she'd grown fond of these people. We aren't twelve. We recognize that this is something rare and impossible. I'll miss him when he's gone. I'll miss all of you. But the truth went deeper than that. I'll be broken when he leaves. Mercy smiled bravely anyway. Lucas has told me how important his role is to him, to his family, and to the crown. I understand family loyalty. But you also have experience leaving family, Sarah pointed out gently. I was replaceable. How hard it was to say that. But not nearly as hard as it would be to say goodbye to Lucas in a few days. As I understand it, Lucas can't be replaced since he's the prince's double. And Evan had debilitating stage fright. There was a knock on the front door. No one had knocked since the storms began. Visitors meant open roads. Open roads meant Lucas would be leaving. I'm not ready. Mercy's heart dropped to her toes. Feet dragging, she went to open the door. A large snowmobile was parked at the end of the snow tunnel they kept clear from the front porch to the road. The naughty elf stood on the porch, wearing helmets, goggles, ski pants, and jackets. May we come in, dear? Prue asked, although she led the elderly trio inside without waiting for Mercy's permission. They shed their helmets, goggles, and jackets. And then Prue looked around. Love what you've done to the place. Black and white. A bold statement. Ahoy! Sugarplum flew into the foyer and landed on Mercy's shoulder. I am royal. We are the naughty elves. June slipped on her olish glasses and peered at the parrot. Pleased to meet you. Odette extended a hand toward Sugarplum, bells on her wrists jingling. Sugarplum squawked and fluttered in the air, landing on Odette's wrist, only to grab onto her bracelet and give it a good tug. Odette shrieked. Prue screamed. June sked and fluttered forward, sweeping the bird from Odette's arm to her own. There now. I shall find you bells fit for royalty. Sleigh bells ring. Sugarplum bobbed and swayed on June's forearm. Are you listening? In the lane, June warbled. Prue and Odette joined to make it a quartet. Snow is glistening. Sugarplum danced and bobbed again. A beautiful sight. We're happy tonight. The quartet finished off the verse with a high-pitched, walking in a winter wonderland. Accented with a timely squawk from Sugarplum. Odette clapped her hands and bowed to the bird. Clever, talented, and beautiful. Prue chuckled. Ladies, I do believe we have just met our spirit animal. Sugarplum deserves a treat. June dug into her pocket and pulled out an almond that she fed to the parrot. This certainly will be less entertaining without the shell Sugarplum. But it will have to do until I can find you some nuts that meet your standards. Footsteps pounded on the stairs as four men raced downstairs to see what was happening. Even Maxwell got up from his resting place. We're fine, Mercy reassured everyone, watching Sugarplum gingerly scoot herself onto June's shoulder. Lucas came to Mercy's side, placing his arm around her waist. Hello again. The naughty elves curtsied with a chorus of, Your Highness. Lucas nodded as if accepting his due. Mercy felt uncomfortable. And it wasn't just because the naughty elves' wide-eyed stares were fixed on Lucas' arm around Mercy's waist. She didn't want to be part of the lie. We just came by to see how the royals were faring through the snowstorm. June preened at Sugarplum. Some folks don't do well with being snowed in. Odette fluffed the petals of the poinsettia embroidered on her sweater. We learned that by watching The Shining. Prue nodded, still wide-eyed, as if the classic horror film still gave her nightmares. We're fine, Lucas reassured them. So, no one's been fighting? Prue traced her finger over her eyebrow and glanced from Maxwell's vivid black eye and stitches to Evan's fading black eye and stitches. Tempers aren't flaring? Odette's head was on the swivel, logging in everyone's reaction to her question, setting her dangling earrings, gingerbread men, dancing. No, Mercy assured them. Prue tipped her nose up and sniffed, smile growing. But there is love in the air. 
Once again, the naughty elves paid significant notice of Lucas' hand resting on Mercy's hip. No one said a thing. And here we thought Christmas Town's holiday magic was on hiatus due to the storms, June twittered. Or royals, Odette said slyly. Anyway, we should get going. Prue picked up a helmet and handed it to Odette, then added, Now that we've seen, you aren't in need of any nudges. Nudges? Lucas asked, frowning. Nudges toward love. Odette giggled. The sound chimed like the many bells she wore. We'll be expecting a royal proclamation, er, invitation. Any day. Prue nodded. The love boat, Sugarplum sang. Oh, did you notice? June stepped over to Mercy and gently guided Sugarplum onto Mercy's shoulder. The thin retiree motioned toward the front doors. There's a white rose sticking out of the snow to the right of the porch. Lucas stiffened. A Christmas rose? June nodded. Broke right through ten feet of snow and ice. A police siren bleeped out front. Oh. Prue smashed her helmet on her head and snapped her goggles into place. That's our cue to return to over the river. We may have borrowed a snowmobile without permission. Odette buckled her helmet strap beneath her chin. It's not like it ever gets used. June was slower to put on her gear, still studying Lucas and Mercy. And we were planning on returning it. They're trying to say that you shouldn't think of the naughty elves as joyriding, lawbreaking miscreants, Mercy said, feeling as if she knew them well enough to tease after serving on the Christmas pageant committee with them these past few months. The police siren bleeped once more, sending Prue and Odette scurrying out the front door and letting in a blast of cold air. We know exactly who we are. June tipped her pointed chin into the air and followed her knitting matchmakers. We only wish everyone had the same self-awareness. We wish you a Merry Christmas, Sugarplum sang. And a speedy getaway, June warbled, lightening the mood and making everyone laugh. In the doorway, June paused and eyed Lucas, all you need for a proper getaway is a destination. But I suspect His Highness always knows his destination, doesn't he? Lucas shut the door behind them and stared at Mercy with an inscrutable look. Except. Mercy recognized the unspoken message behind those blue eyes. He was getting ready to say goodbye. Hey. What's wrong? Lucas found Mercy in the basement storage room after dinner. She was sitting in the Montgomery chair where they'd found the journal, and it looked as if she'd been crying. Mercy held up a hand. I just. There are a lot of people in this house, and I just needed a moment alone. Lucas stopped short of drawing her to her feet for a reassuring hug. Do you? Should I go? No, she blinked back tears. After the naughty elves came and went, I realized how little time we had left. I'll be fine in a minute. Or by morning. She wiped at her cheek. Lucas had been keeping one hand behind his back. But now, he held out a flower. I got this for you. It was a white flower. The Christmas rose the naughty elves had noticed blooming above the snowline. The rose that Louis gave Florence? Mercy sniffed. That's so sweet. Yeah. Lucas scuffed his sneakers on the floor. I had Evan hold on to me just in case I took a header off the porch and suffocated in the snowdrift. What am I saying? I'm ruining the moment. This isn't about me. I mean. You are worth the risk to life and limb because, Lucas' throat dried up. He stared at Mercy. You're falling in love with me, Mercy finished for him in a small voice. That's the worst news I've heard all day. I don't want to ask you to stop fulfilling your duty or take you away from your family. But I'm falling in love with you, too, and I don't know what to do about it. And then she started to cry. A long time later, Lucas walked into the room he shared with Evan, his feet dragging. The prince sat at an antique desk Sarah had moved into the room. He was bent over his phone, lips moving as if he were talking to himself. We need to talk. He sat on his bed and then said, nothing. This was just as hard as talking about his feelings for mercy with mercy. If you're trying to say you're in love with mercy, I know that already, Evan said gravely. We all do. No. I mean, yes. I think I love her. Because Mercy was great. 
She was smart and funny, skilled with power tools and renovation. He'd learned a lot from her just in the past few days. But she was also kind-hearted and caring, with a strong desire to be her own person. And that was something he wanted for himself. The truth of the matter is that I've been living your life for you. Your public life, that is. Which doesn't allow me a private life. He rubbed a hand over his face. Not that I'm stepping down from my royal duties. That went against everything he was as well. But you're going to step down, Evan said in a low voice, touching the stitches in his eyebrow. Even when this heals, you won't look like me anymore. The doctor told me it's going to leave a scar. Lucas frowned. In your eyebrow. Can't they put in hair plugs or something? You're suggesting I get plastic surgery instead of standing up for myself? Evan scoffed. You really must love me, cousin. I do. You'll be my king someday. The word came out with the raw tone of the truth. Evan would be king, and he'd need Lucas more than ever. But, Evan turned his phone over and ran a hand through his hair. I won't be the kind of king who deserves that kind of allegiance if I don't figure this out. This. This reason that I can't stand in front of a crowd without freezing up. Lucas nodded, feeling sadness well up inside of him. A sadness for the burdens his cousin carried, ones he couldn't always help him fix. Like Evan's stage fright. Which is why you have my full support in pursuit of a future with mercy, Evan said flatly, looking a bit surprised at his own words. What? Lucas frowned. What are you saying? I'm saying that no matter how things turn out, Evan gestured out the window and then around the room. If mercy returns with you to Verdania or if you stay here with her, you'll have my blessing. I can't let you cover my deficiencies anymore. I appreciate that. Lucas stood and moved toward Evan, holding out his hand. Evan took it, shook it, and then got to his feet, smiling ruefully. I think a hug is more appropriate, don't you? I can't thank you enough for all you've done for me. Yes, your highness. The words. The title had never felt more real. The two men hugged. They hugged for a long time. Long enough for something inside Lucas to shift into place. He was finally taking his own journey. He just hadn't expected leaving the past behind to be bittersweet. Have you had time to read the journal yet? Mercy turned to smile at Lucas the next morning, a small, flat trowel in her hand. She was in the middle of grouting a third-floor bathroom wall, floor to ceiling, with white grout to fill the gaps between white subway tile. I've been too busy tiling bathrooms and cooking meals for recreational reading. Lucas leaned against the bathroom's door jam, looking handsome in a pair of blue jeans and a blue, paint-stained t-shirt. You should have read more about Louis and Florence's courtship. Did you finally prove that Louis or Florence were from Verdania? That was the hope of the royal entourage. Even Albert was intrigued enough to request a family history of the couple through contacts in Verdania. Not yet. But I will. Mercy put more grout on her trowel and smeared it into the gaps between the tile, preferring this line of conversation to the circular discussion they'd been having earlier about the future of their blossoming love. If you'd read the journal, you'd know that Louis was traveling west with his family, while Florence was born and raised in Christmas Town. Lucas came to stand beside her. He gently took the trowel from her and set it in the grout bucket. They were planning their lives in different places, and then a snowstorm hit. And they found a Christmas rose fighting for existence in all that snow, Mercy said softly. She'd heard him tell the story more than once, after all. Look, Lucas. I've thought about this. I'm committed to the Hollyberry Inn. And I don't want to be the reason you gave up something that's an integral part of you. His arms came around her, so tender and full of promise, so achingly familiar. And yet, so soon to be absent from her life. What if I didn't have to give up my royal duties? She raised her head, needing to see his dear face. Is Evan moving to Christmas Town? Or are you thinking you can fly to wherever he needs you to be? That doesn't sound very practical, she rushed on. And if I know one thing about you, it's that you're practical. Lucas explained about Evan's stitches leaving a scar. He's taking that as a sign that he has to face his fears. In fact, it looks like he wants to stay in Christmas Town to work on delivering his speech to Matteo Santander when he presents him with sugar plum. 
the speech Lucas was supposed to give. How long? Mercy asked breathlessly, barely daring to hope it was forever. Until he's confident he can do it. Mercy clung to Lucas tight enough to never let him go. I love you, she whispered. I think I loved you from the moment our eyes met. Gertrude creaked and groaned, making Mercy smile. There's something to the stories about this house, Lucas said in a quiet, somber voice. Something that makes it truly special. And a truly special place for us to solidify the feelings between us. And how that fits with our families and responsibilities, Mercy added hesitantly. Yes. Lucas nodded. And then, he kissed her. He kissed her the way he had that first time. A kiss that was achingly perfect and tenderly familiar, a match made, not by naughty elves, but by kismet and fate, a love that promised to thrive like a rose blooming despite a fierce snowstorm. And then Lucas told Mercy, I love you. And I promise to work as hard at making that love a lifelong promise as I did at fulfilling my royal duties. With charm, Mercy murmured. He nodded. But without lies. Gertrude groaned once more. Lucas smiled, bringing his lips closer to hers. I think our Christmas angel approves. Totally, 